All right, let's call the meeting to order. First up is public comment. This is for anything that's not currently on the agenda. Not there. I think we got Betsy I saw up there. He's gonna... Yeah. Can I start? Yep. Or are there other people? Nope, you're it. Okay, well, I was hoping that we would be on the agenda. I was on last month on public comments, hoping that we would asking to be on the agenda. Uh, because what we want to share is gonna take way more than three minutes. Um, we have to know, the committee needs to know if this is a prior, priority, excuse me, priority to the town. And is the town going to commit any hours to help with project management? We have, it was brought up that there might need to be more parking. And as I said last month, we have found two, we've talked to two owners, one is indeed uh, would talk with the town. Um, we don't know what the process is after we get that information. Uh, we can give you the information and you can talk to them. We don't know what the, we don't know what, we don't know what the next step is. We need a lot, a lot more guidance through the town. Um, we don't know if we need more parking. Uh, it sounds like we do, but they never used to have to have any extra parking and other towns on state roads, Tunbridge as an example, doesn't have, they park along the street when they, you know what it's like at Tunbridge Fair for crying out loud. They park along the street when they, when they have any big events at their town hall and their church. Uh, a street meaning Route 110. Um, we did have a meeting, a couple of us with Trini and discussed the idea of hiring the next architect slash structural engineer for the next phase that would come up with construction documents. Um, that's something that maybe this committee could work on. But again, without town, the town giving some sort of having a project manager or somebody helping with guidance specifically, uh, we do not want to put a, lot, put a lot of volunteer energy into something that's going to be um, not felt like it's worthwhile. One of the other things we wanted to discuss with you was there were a lot of things that Red Loaf had on the um, <clears throat> their proposals that, or there were a lot of options there that took it up into the million dollar and then $2 million bracket. And we have looked at it a little bit more closely and feel that there's some paring down, quite a bit of paring down we can do to perhaps make it uh, at least less than a million and still have it <laughs> usable. But again, we really need a project manager from the town. We are, we're a great committee. We want to help. We just need someone who's got more skills to guide us and contacts. Or Maybe the town doesn't want to do anything with the building. And if that's so, it would be really nice to know now before we put in a whole lot more volunteer time. So again, we were requesting to be on the agenda so that we can have a discussion with you about this. So Betsy, this afternoon you talked about um, creating a smaller working group 
to figure out kind of what what you're really after and what the definition is and where this building, you know, how do you get this building into the priority ranking for, you know, where the town invests money. Um, you know, when we talk money, it's more than just dollars, it's labor hours, it's, you know, there's a whole array of resources the town has, you know, so we don't have a project manager sitting here waiting for the next project to come through the door. We would have to be taking somebody off something they're doing now to put hours onto that. So how do you get into the queue, so to speak, to figure out where this project ranks with others when it comes to the limited resources we have in the town? And, and I think there needs to be a little more understanding about kind of what what the roles and responsibilities are, what that looks like, what the, before it's ready for the, you know, I don't know that this is ready for the board to say, yes, this is something we want to commit to, and this is what we want to do, and this is the direction we want to go, because it feels like we are getting kind of a, a mishmash of stuff that isn't sorted out into that format. You're right, Trini. I, if there could be a, one or two representatives from the town who are paid and one or two representatives from this group that are unpaid meet and uh, however long that means and put together a preliminary plan that will always have need massaging of course that would that first meeting might be uh, a couple of different meetings and then i would think monthly an hour or two monthly might be what you're looking at. I mean, I'll, I'm pretty, well, it would, it would change. It wouldn't be exactly that. Some months would be an hour, another month might be three hours of somebody's time. I, it's depends on what phase everything's at. I'm not um, sure I agree with that. I think you got to get through the first hurdle of what is this project? What are the roles and responsibilities of, that you're asking the town and is it something the town wants to take on to begin with i think you gotta get exactly. over that hurdle first so yep. and i don't think that's a one or two to three hours a month i think that's a time commitment sitting down to figure out kind of what it is where the responsibility for each thing lies and how that might look i mean there's many models you can use to take this on but I don't, I don't think this is as well thought out yet to a point where I would feel comfortable saying, yeah, let's dive into this because I don't think we know what we're diving into. Well, I sure don't, I sure don't. I had no idea parking would be a problem or anything like that. And I had no idea there were all these three phases to architectural things and um, yeah. And it doesn't have, it can be a two year project. It doesn't have to be that we're ready by this spring to go out to bid. Uh, that was my magic wand, but um, so do, do you want to make this an agenda item somewhere in the near future? Do you, what do you want to do with all of this? And, uh, we have discussed, by the way, one of the pieces I didn't share and I was sharing with Trini this afternoon was, we have discussed what the building could be in the future. We have several lists and we talked about marketing and there are so many things that could be going on with that building that never happened in the past. There's, it can be an educational center where there's all kinds of training going on from health to to arts and crafts, to... So Betsy, I don't wanna shut you down, but the topic we need to just stop with We're is, done. Okay. you know, we'll talk and right. figure out if we have, you know, okay. what, what we do with that. All right, so what do you want us to do next? I would say... Um, I think it's an agenda item to kind of clarify a little bit more about this because 
you know, when this originally started, it was, uh, we need to get the building fixed up so we can get to use the building again because it isn't up to code. You know, now it's turned into a two and a half million dollar resurrection here. And I'm not quite sure wherever it was. I mean, there was numbers floating all over the place from one and a half to two and a half million and raising the building. And, and you know, that's way beyond the scope of what I think needs to happen. I mean, that could be a longer term plan, but you've got to somehow figure out how to get the building into a functional state. And that's kind of where you got to figure out the uses and how that all fits into the scope of what the town's needs are. So do you want to add an item to the agenda, Jay, think, to talk about? I think you need to do that. How we define it. Okay. And from that, we might be able to get to this potential working group. Okay. All right. Do we have anybody else? What's, from the, we're going to add this as an agenda item tonight, Betsy. Do we have uh, any other public comment? Yes. I'm, I'm here for public. Are you public comment or you're on the agenda? Am I? Yeah, you are. On the agenda. Oh, okay, then never mind. Yeah. You're good. Okay. Not seeing any um, approval of the agenda. Do we have anything else to add? So it would just be as amended if you're adding that and then where you'd want to put that particular one? It's item J, 5J. <laughs> the only question I would have about adding it to the agenda tonight <coughs> is do we have enough information mm. beyond what we've already just heard from Betsy to add it to the agenda? I think the only action item for us to discuss tonight is if we want to commit resources to sitting down and figuring out roles and responsibilities okay. and what this even looks like, right. what this beast is, you know. Okay. I think that's tonight's topic. It, we don't have anywhere near enough to right. say right. we're all in. Right, I just to be clear about what we were yeah. adding. Thanks. So we have approval of the agenda. Need a motion, second, as amended, if you're so inclined. Yes. Um, will we um, adopt the agenda as amended? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> motion carries. Consent calendar, we have mini meeting minutes and warrants. So here. All good, move to approve the consent calendar. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Um, new business. We have uh, consider excavator and truck purchase. One of the original ideas when we started talking about adding this to the agenda was playing off of that conversation from I think it was last April where we had asked and you had granted a request to try and pursue a purchase of a used excavator that reportedly had low hours on it. That purchase process was fraught and that machine turned out to have significantly more hours than, than were originally conveyed. It forced us to scramble a little bit throughout the summer. We ended up renting a unit for around month three now that we've rented an excavator in some fashion and we've been able to knock off projects such as North Randolph Road, the Howard Hill Grants and Aid Project, did the culvert up on Hollyhock and some others. Yep. So it's, we've certainly gotten our, our time out of it. One of the conversations that's sort of evolved even from when we put this on the agenda is an idea to maybe take a step back from this spot, um, consider what it would look like if we continued and maybe beefed up our rental program in terms of the excavator plan projects around that rental window. And then looked at how to maybe um, both in this fiscal year and then in planning for the next one, meet some of the other equipment needs that are out there as well. And so it's really about seeking blessing for this exploration, trying to figure out, for example, the things that fall in there. Pickup truck we were thinking about was replacing like for like. There's some merit in going with a larger one um, that can carry crew members more comfortably, a little bit heavier duty, has a little more functionality when it comes to helping with winter maintenance and other activities. And then also the rollers from 1983. Three. Okay, I was going to say four. I, was, I had it younger than I was. We've continued to have pump issues. That piece of equipment has been really vital in um, some of the pothole repairing program. Um, and when it's down, it really hampers, if not stops that effort. The loader is now, that was how old, just as a 90, it's a 98. 98. It's got 19,000 hours. So that's, uh, that's, that's aged. That's the Methuselah of, lo of loaders there. You know, it's on the far end of the spectrum. Um, so some of it's about trying to figure out how these different pieces fit together, maybe coming back to you if you're open to that sort of exploration, looking to replace some of those 
in a different order. We've had them envisioned at different points in different variations of the capital program for years, but they're either on the cusp uh, of, of concern or like the roller, we've experienced that. And we think we can solve the excavator need in a different way. Um, and it's also mindful of the available resources now and later. So it's a long way of saying, I think we're still trying to shape exactly what it is because we've got more needs than this. So is there, is there a way we can essentially trade two for four, say, is an easy way to think about it. That's the basic introduction to that topic. And then John's here and can talk to you more about each piece of these things and how they fit together. And it gives us a little more time to think about financing options. We've been focused on use of those capital reserves, but some of these might lend themselves to lease to own type programs, which we've used for stuff before. Um, there are straight up leasing options, so it's you enter a multi, much like you would with an automobile, and at the end of it, we turn it in and, and lease a brand new one. It gets you out of some of those R and M type costs, and so some of it lets us certainly, I think, more with the loader, maybe the roller, in terms of those. The truck would probably still be a straight reserve fund purchase. Um, we have a rough idea. That was the quote from today with trade in. We think we get about eleven thousand dollars. This is for the Silverado that's about seven years old. Uh, that is used primarily by the superintendent, but it, it could be traded for something larger with a little more functionality, is the idea. Mm -hmm. So it's an evolving process, but I wanted to make sure we were having that conversation because the dollars can get pretty hefty pretty quickly. Positive of leasing the excavator, though, is you can charge that off to grants. Yep. I guess when we get the, the grants to do culverts and to do ditching, right, you can yeah. charge that lease right off to that. So Howard Hill. Use it to do some other stuff like yeah. that. Howard Hill, for example, will be charged off to a grant. North Randolph went to the stormwater reserve as a water quality project. And the rest of the rental hits the, the equipment line. So we're also able to spread spread, spread it out so it doesn't out. hit yeah. one spot. <clears throat> I think it makes sense to, to take a step back and look at both the roller and the loader. Well, and that's, you know, the, ro the loader is very vital. I mean, that, you know, we have a loader in each garage and, you know, if one loader goes down, you know, we're, in we're, in, we're in trouble, you know? And I mean, perfect, you know, ex example is the truck that we're trading in, the 10 wheeler, that's a 2013. Um, last week we were using it because we had to, the truck died, you know, and we had to get it towed down to the dealer and of course, in order to trade it in, it has to be running, you know, and I just, we almost $10,000 for a whole new fuel system just to make the truck run so we can trade it in, you know, and it's like, so what happens if that's our loader? You know, we have an excavator sitting in the barn that can't do nothing, but yet we're, you know, we're out of loader. So, mm -hmm. and then the roller, the same deal all summer long. I mean, we've eaten, you know, the manufacturer has dealt with us and I mean, they've gone through three brand new pumps that they sent us. You know, we put five hours on it one time, it blew apart, three hours the next. Now, they're, <coughs> they've took full responsibility and are rebuilding it, but still it comes to the fact that, you know, downtime. it's downtime. And we, you know, I, I can't make the guys that I have, I mean, we're shorthanded as it is, but I can't make them, you know, hand tamp a ton of asphalt. You know, that's just, mm -hmm. and gold patch, you can't get it right now. So it's just like, you know, our hands are, are tied to a certain aspect and it's just like you know we got to look at this at a better for us you know in the future and i think the new roller you know we could use it for doing culverts and you know good good compaction in the roads when we're changing the culverts and you know or like we did on north randolph yeah. you know so you're not talking a very big one here like, like one ton or something yeah it's, yeah. it's like a a 3.5 you know it's yeah. a it's just yeah, it's yeah. pretty much the same size as what we have now it's just got more you know it's got the dual vibratory drums right. vibratory and, drums um yeah. And it makes sense to upgrade that truck yeah. while you're at it too. Yeah. Especially if you gotta move some of this stuff around. Right. You don't have to tie up the dump truck. Mm -hmm. something. So you wanted to have his blessing to come back with a plan on how you're, you're gonna make all that stuff yeah. work. If you're okay with this. Mm -hmm. Altering that route a little bit for what is hopefully sort of better, broader, short and long term outcome. How we do it at least. So. I mean, how's the running excavators? Just out of curiosity. Um, we've got about a hundred. No, 
Yeah, yeah, just under 200 hours. On both of them? Uh, on the you had a demo one or the, on the cat one? Yeah. And you had a demo one for what, a couple weeks? Yep. And we put almost 80 on that, you know, so. Yeah. And it was good. I mean, we've gotten, you know, the big projects that we wanted. We still have a few more before the big excavator leaves, but, you know, for the three months that we've had it, I think we've accomplished a lot of work, you know. Mm -hmm. and unfortunately, you know, majority of the guys are in one spot just because it's a big project, but um, it's stuff that needed to be done. So. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Go drain it up. <laughs> <laughs> you are blessed. <laughs> All right. Consider accepting grants for Kimball Library. So Amy hop on earlier, so she is here and can explain. These are a couple that you authorized the application for that have come back around to be to be granted. Good news. Mm -hmm. so this was a fifty thousand and a twenty four thousand and change, with the match being made by the. Library trustees. Yep. Anybody have any questions on those? Mm -hmm. If not, it was a pretty good week that week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Seventy-five. So. Right? Yeah. Sweet. Any motions to accept them? Move that we accept both grants. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. <laughs> that was easy. Yeah. Thanks, Amy. Thanks a lot, folks. <laughs> Take care. Consider an invitation to join Ideal. So this is a new program run through the state's um, uh, the executive director of racial equity is the point person on this and is listed on the communications. It's a state initiative that involves partners such as the League of Cities and Towns. Rural Development and Community Foundation are also in the mix. Um, this is additional um, or new, depending on where you're at in the process. Diversity, equity, and inclusion work. We'd be part of the inaugural cohort. Um, so the initial class, we've been invited with some others as a community that has adopted a declaration of inclusion. We did that close to a year and a half ago now. That was pretty close to when I started, so I do remember that one. Um, we have until September 12th to consider joining. It doesn't look like there's anything involved from us other than some time and sweat equity. Um, we'll be eligible up for small grants for implementation. So in the um, flyer that's in there, let's see if I can find the page where they've listed it, so that there are different, it's the access to grant funding, there are different workshops, technical assistance, some data sharing, and they list some of the ideas um, in addition to sort of a general uh, education improvement type of effort. There are help with different policies, different equity efforts, um, policing, obviously we'd be working with partners with that, so any sort of planning, strategy, and other data work. So we get to be a member. I haven't seen exactly who's signed up yet, although I know that there's been certainly some interest in a number of quarters. So it's important work, and it's the kind of thing that been around for a long time, but this is not anything that I could replicate for you. Um, take somebody who knows it and folks with lived experience. And mm -hmm. sounds like there's I, some really good partners. Yeah. Of course, you're adding this too. It starts on October 26th. Thanks, John. Have a good night, guys. Night. When you say it starts on October 26th, with, with what? I mean, I think it's they're going to get a sense of what the structure of it is. Yeah, I think they're going to bring everybody together, and then they'll review the the structure. I imagine at that point they'll lay out kind of what the curriculum is going to be. I guess, for lack of a better, you know, here's how we'll move through these pieces. Um, and is the curriculum targeting select board members or I think it's local. town staff or? Yeah, it's sort of broadly defined in the materials as municipalities. But I think they're looking at local officials, both elected, appointed, volunteer. Um, I think the idea is to start sort of with the, the leadership groups and figure out if there's a way to kind of broaden access uh, and or incorporate anything that comes out of that into those broader activities. Mm -hmm. 
it's a this was a new program and a, a, a new experience for me so in terms of sort of fully understanding how we'll ride the river that's a little harder to say yeah. any questions thoughts motions I'll move that we um, <clears throat> I accept the invitation to join the ideal initiative. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion Aye. opposed. Motion carries. Next up is a signed permit appeal by Justin Bloom. So Mark is just, hang on. here as well and thought we'd handle it like we handled some of the other semi formal processes we do. Mm -hmm have the backgrounder and the process stuff and then you can talk to Justin about the request and the appeal and then have a general conversation if that makes some sense to mm -hmm. order that and so Mark is on here and can run you through the conversations they had in, in the process to get us to this moment and you are the body listed in the sign ordinance to hear the appeals so uh, hi Are you ready for me to talk Sure. Sure. Go ahead, Mark. Okay. Uh, once again, my name is Mark. Uh, I serve uh, as zone uh, sign officer, uh, also zoning administrator and economic development director for the town. Uh, my role as the sign officer is to administer and enforce the provisions of the the sign ordinance. Uh, so, just a brief uh, description of this appeal uh, on August twenty fifth. Mr. Poulin, Justin Poulin, completed an application for a sign application for a temporary sign. And that sign was going to be placed on the Splitter Island in town at the intersection of 12 and 12A. Uh, on August 30th, I sent Mr. Poulin uh, a denial letter based on Section 207 of, of, the, of the ordinance. Uh, would it be simple? Would it be helpful if I read that? or? Do we all have copies of that? Do we know what that is? Maybe just a quick bullet, what the two sections are. One that prohibits okay. signs on the Splitter yeah. Island and the other has a size requirement, shall not exceed three square feet, so. Uh, so the on the 30th, Mr. Poulin uh, was issued that denial letter. Uh, on the, and then on a few days later, uh, he filed an appeal and uh, he believes that he he's not uh, he's not considered an ongoing concern or entity, which is part of uh, number two of that section two hundred seven. And he also believes that he's so he believes he's not an ongoing commercial entity or an established business. And he cited uh, BSA twenty four and Act one forty three, which he believes he's exempt uh, from because he's a farm operation. Uh, so I provided him with uh, the an understanding of what his rights are for appeal and that sort of thing, and that's why uh, that's why we're here tonight. Can I just say anything? Just I guess that's all of it, Mark. That you have. Uh, yes, I can answer any other questions, uh, but that's that's the gist of it. Yes. Do you look up these two citations? Uh, these two citations I have looked up, and uh, but I'm not. I'm certainly not. Uh, I'm not a, a professional in terms of understanding what these are. But my belief is that uh, if you're if you're in business, uh, Mr. Poulin has a, a not only an ice cream uh, operation, which is fantastic. My wife and I have been there. Uh, you know the, but you're an ongoing business entity, and you're a commercial enterprise. Um, I do understand that there are certain exemptions for farming, and uh, but I, it just does not. I don't feel like this fits within that parameter. So uh, you know the the town is was very clear in the sign ordinance that they frown on having it really much in this area, and of all the. Uh, the details in the side ordinance that are somewhat broad, it's very specific in the ordinance about 12 and 12A, the, the splitter island. So uh, I, I can understand Mr. Poulin's point of view. I understand that it's a it's a great place to uh, to stick a, a sandwich board or something like that, but it just doesn't 
it doesn't work. Uh, it's not in the ordinance, and you know my job is to enforce that. So, but I am happy to to talk with him about other ideas uh, to help him with his business. But in terms of being the sign officer, uh, it's very clear what's in the ordinance, and this doesn't pass muster. And just to be clear, the sign ordinance is a totally separate ordinance from zoning. Mm -hmm. They're passed as two separate pieces. We just have the same person enforcing them. <coughs> Correct. Yeah, one is through this section related of Title 24 is the whole municipal section of statute. So your zoning authority is in there, it's, its own separate category. Sign regulation is under our general regulatory powers. Um, so much like when we consider traffic and other ordinances, it's that broad set of powers given to us to, to regulate various things through ordinances primarily. Any other questions on that side of it? Can the public make a comment? No, nope, not yet. Okay. Um, it's your turn, just Should I stand at the microphone? Or it? it's, it's, no, it's just you picking you up there. for the, you everything will pick there. you up from right there. Just. Okay, so I'm a little confused because I had asked to address the select board on a different reason, and not a different reason, but a reason related to this. I'm getting the feeling that this is the actual appeal and that's not what I came prepared for because I thought I would I just turned my appeal in the other day and I thought I would get notice of when that appeal would be so I didn't come here tonight to prepare for an actual appeal process I came here for a different reason and I thought I made that clear to Mark when I had asked to be placed placed on the agenda so I'm, I'm not prepared for the official appeal process. I mean, I could probably add lib, but that's not why I'm here tonight. So without going into what it is, can you give me just like a one sentence of what you thought you were gonna be on the agenda for? I would like to talk about the zoning ordinance itself and possibly you doing- sign ordinance. The sign, sign ordinance and possibly um, a consideration of amending that ordinance. Okay, so amending the ordinance is done by the planning commission. Okay, but it's so, it's, so that is fine, and I, I'm not expecting an amendment to happen tonight, but I would feel that it would, if I bring up the issues that I feel should be amended, that the select board could then turn that over to the zoning and the planning, the, the planning commission who could then come back with a recommendation to the select board. Or, or not, they could consider the request and hold the, the select board has, has the authority in my understanding. I, I'm aware of the authority they have, yes. To, I, to, I, to, I'm to there, change right? ordinances. I'm aware of that, thank so you. So I'm that's why I'm going to the select board. Gotcha. Because right. I could go to the I could go to the planning commission and they can just throw it out and not even go anywhere with it. That's why I feel that I would like to approach a select board and get the select board's support or not and, and go from there. The problem I have with this zoning, the sign ordinance, it was amended July 9th of 2020 and the opportunity for public input at that time was very limited, if not limited totally, because it was during COVID and there was no public meetings and nobody was really participating in anything. So the opportunity to weigh in at that time wasn't, was very limited. I thought the changes were pretty limited too, weren't they? Yeah, the changes were But, much. but this, this particular subject here that Justin's addressing, in my opinion, is now blossomed, okay, and it's been going on. I'm not really sure that, the triangle's not the only part of it, that I think is the problem, but you know, if you drive around here, you'll see, you know, Blueberry Farm up the road here, Beer Farm, Beer over here. You're, you're got all these different signs that are showing up at the ends of these dirt roads that are illegal signs, yeah. okay, because they're not on their property. And some of them are sandwich boards, some of them are, you know, like a, uh, on a wire post thing, you know, like a, like a political sign. Mm -hmm. So those are all showing up. And I do think that, you know, I think we ought to kick this back to the Planning Commission and see if we can figure out how to fix that problem because I don't see it going away, but what I do see it doing is ticking off a lot of people who are, you know, in these rural agricultural areas and they're doing these different things. You know, creamies, Woods is selling creamies, 
Silhouettes is selling creamies. Justin's selling creamies. Every, you know, Woods have got something at the bottom of Everett Hill. You know, I, I just think that there's, we need to address this. And I don't think we really took care of it when we presented it to the select board to be adopted. Because I think Justin said, you know, it was, it was a pretty limited conversation. And there wasn't a lot of public input. I think we were after content mm -hmm. in that one. Isn't that part of the, the whole thing with mm -hmm. some, the way some of our sentences were phrased? Well, it was, there was, uh, there was a, there was a court ruling about about uh, signs that you couldn't a lot of a lot of not a, you couldn't discriminate a lot of conversation about that where you know somebody wanted to put a sign up you couldn't it had to be content neutral and all these different things and that was the focus on why that got changed because our sign ordinance is pretty outdated this kind of stuff was discussed but not thoroughly and there's a lot of these signs out there you know you, mm -hmm. you, you know you've all seen them but, you know, they're, they're probably going to get more over yeah. the next couple of months. Because yeah. <laughs> all the political ones join in. Well, the political ones were addressed, but, you know, these <laughs> things for, you know, you look at the these little businesses that, you know, we're trying to encourage here, you know, these rural enterprises. And, you know, one comes to mind is, you know, look at the work we had to do to try to get the, the wine situation squared away. I mean, we put a lot of effort yeah. into trying to get that to fit. And, you know, he's got a sign at the bottom of his hill. Is it a legal sign, not legal sign? Uh, that could be debated. So I think we need to go back and look at this. So. And I did bring, I mean, I brought a handout for you that of some ideas that I would like to present to you if it's appropriate, and then you could, um, but it's. Okay, it's not on the agenda. Right. Um, right. So what we can do is we can send you to the planning commission to have the conversation. Well, I'd like to leave these on the table and you can pick them up and look at sure. them. Sure, yeah. Um, but that's that's why, I, and if I have to be asked to come back on the agenda, I would like to do that. But that's what I originally thought this was for tonight. So, um, because the conversation Mark and I had um, probably about two and a half weeks ago before I submitted my appeal, that's when I had asked to be placed on the agenda. Um, and I guess it just morphed into something a little bit different. So, yep. um, you're welcome to leave those for the okay. board to look at, and we'll also toss this to the planning commission okay. so they can. So, should I officially request up. to be placed on the agenda again to talk about this in more depth, or before it goes to the planning commission, or? No, I think it goes. To I, the think planning just, commission. I think you just kick that to the planning commission. Right. I'd rather have you go to the planning commission. No, no. I think you know, we, we, we'll we make the Arizona directive to planning the planning commission, commission that they right. revisit the sign ordinance. Right. But it, I would like to say I think this change would address a lot of my concerns that are going to come up in the appeal. Um, and if this, the, the appeal, unfortunately, we have to hear on the existing. I understand one. that. Yep. But in the future, if this something like this could happen, it would address you know what we're talking about now mm -hmm. and if i may jump in he uh he did say that he was uh he did want to speak tonight about <clears throat> sort of the big picture issue of of sign ordinance in town however if we're following the, the ordinance itself there are date there are time specifications in terms of how long an appeal is open and available so uh the it, I, I felt like it was important to put it on the way we did and it wasn't I didn't try to blindside you at all Justin it was just to to just follow procedure right I thought I would get a, a letter saying when that appeal would be I mean I just literally turned that appeal in last last week so right you again if I, I'm not trying to be doing well, anything, but it's so Mark what is that time what does that so time the, the, table look like yeah the timetable is pretty short it's uh the uh the like 15 days to appeal. Yeah, whoever receives the denial letter has 15 days from the date of the denial letter to file an appeal. And at that point, uh, there's the, the select board then has a, a very strict time frame to respond and, and then it's over. And the whole idea behind this was just to make this process simple and smooth so it didn't take up a great deal of time for everybody, uh, just because it can become time consuming. So uh, Justin met his appeal time in the 15 days. When do we have to have a hearing on it and respond by? And what, what I'm wanting okay. to know is, is the yes. next month's meeting okay or do we have to do something? Okay, so the, the action by the select board 
uh, it says here, the select board shall hold a duly warned public hearing within 45 days of receipt of an appeal and shall render a decision within 15 days after the close of the final hearing. So we'll hold the hearing on it next month. Okay. That'll be within the 45 days. Right. Okay. Yes, that's true. His his, his appeal his appeal was dated <laughs> August 30th. Yep. Okay. And I will receive a notice of when that appeal date will be. You just got it. Well, I'd, I'd, like some, I'd like something official. You'll get that. You'll probably get that official notice. Right. <laughs> we haven't just to just to be, we haven't issued any violations or anything like this. We haven't we we we've tried to sort of be somewhat I've tried to be somewhat gentle about this to the to the public. We've made a public notice, we've put a public notice in the paper just so people could be aware to look at the ordinance and to try to uh, to understand and, and sort of meet in the middle in terms of why there's an ordinance and what what we're trying to accomplish. And I think, uh, uh, and that's in my mind, it was sort of a process that would happen over the next six or seven months. Uh, and as applications came in, just like this one with Mr. Poulin, we would, you know, we would have a chance to review them. And in this case, Mr. Poulin's interest was to have his opinion heard about changing the dynamics of the, of the ordinance itself. And I will say Mark's been very pleasant in this whole process. So. Good. 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 All right. So um, we'll move that item to next month's agenda and and send you off to the planning commission. Um, okay. And Perry will have the conversation there also, but Sunny Holt will be the one that okay. will take the lead on that. And I'll hear something from somebody. Maybe. I imagine probably Sunny will. Sunny. If we're on the agenda, you know, to talk about it and revisit the sign ordinance, then he will send you a, a notice of when the planning commission meeting is. Okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Next up is um, to discuss the high school access road closure and emergency services access. Mark, are you hanging out for the speeding ordinance? For the... Do we, do you have another item uh, on here, Mark? Uh, yes, there's, uh, am I, do I need to be here for, I think it would be number uh, G, discuss economic development director zoning admin position, or do you not want me there for that? No, I think you should be. Okay, I'll stay. Yeah. This, uh, I don't have a lot of detail other than the school has considered closing the access road. Concern was raised about it, I think, from the fire service advisory committee level. It's not a uh, municipally owned or maintained piece of infrastructure, as we sort of found out now, was highlighted through the road naming process. So it's really... Um, this is just sort of a general conversation. Do you want to engage the school in any form? Access to the athletic fields, as I understand it, is one of the primary concerns. There might be other building access issues. So this is the road off Central Street that goes in by the superintendent's building. Mm -hmm. I, I saw the, the announcement from the superintendent concerning this road closure. My, my understanding was that it was just that little stretch from the front parking lot to the rear parking lot that goes along the side of the road and that the concern was that um, that with the blind corners there, that that there's been a bunch of um, near misses of some pretty that were pretty scary, and um, and that that's the section that they were interested in in, in getting rid of, not the section from the street to the, the building at, at the yeah. high school. You think you so you think it's the driveway <clears throat> to the superintendent's building? No, that's no, what I'm saying it's not. It's and so the challenge is um, the fire department is not liking this at all, right? And so they're asking if the town wants to get engaged. And what they don't like is that leaves them no way to access all the way around the building, right? And they've also said many a times when they call the emergency services come in the main entrance 
And if they have to go out around back, now they got to go out on the street and come back and they can't make that turn to come back down by the superintendent. So if they're at the wrong site and they got to get to the back, they now have to go to Forest Street, out Wendover, back down, back down Central Street and in by the superintendents. Yeah, I the, can see the concern. I just want to make sure we're talking about that. Yeah, we're talking about the same piece. And <clears throat> the other challenge that was brought up was when there's a lot of uh, athletic events there and they call in emergency services, you can't get out around by um, the tech center and out around back because cars park everywhere. So a lot of the emergency services start in that way and then they end up coming around to that back way and lots of times walking across to get to the people are pushing the gurney or whatever across there. So I think the concern is that they want to make sure that there's a, a pretty robust conversation about what that impact is to them being able to respond to something there. Has have, have, have the fire folks um, spoken with the superintendent about this stuff yet? Yes. Uh, not, I don't know if they've engaged the superintendent. They've engaged Rob. Bob. Uh, so Bob. Facilities people. Bob Worley? Worley? Yeah. yeah. And felt like it wasn't really, they weren't heard. But, you know, Trevor's right. It's not a town road, so we don't have a say in it, but it does have a pretty serious impact on our response. And we're responsible for fire services there. And that's a pretty serious, if it was a new structure, we'd make them have a road all the way around. Exactly, it. I was gonna say, if it was a new structure, they'd have to have a road all the way around buildings, which they don't have any access now on that southwest, southeast corner. Correct. So, do you think the reason for closing this is because of traffic concerns at the crosswalk? Not the crosswalk. No, it's, it's, it's that section it's, that came around where the band and chorus and all that used to be. That kind of funky. Okay, show me where we're going here. All right, so that's the driveway in from, from right, the Right, we're talking about over here. Talking about this little stretch right in there. The curvy section that goes around the building. They want to, they want, oh, they want that bad that. corner. Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah, I'm familiar with that bad corner. Yeah, it's the bad corner. But you can make the bad corner one way, <clears throat> or you could do, there's plenty of other changes yeah, you could make, and it would still be there. It seems like the solution is to close it to normal traffic, but to keep it accessible to emer for emergency. Well, their plan is to turn it into green space. Right, but maybe that's... Maybe they can. Oh my goodness! That totally limits their have, fire protection from that side of the building. But they can yeah, address. Yeah. We can. They can address this. They can address the safety concerns, but leave it as a road. Yeah. Huh. Okay. I bet no one just no one really thought about emergency vehicles when they proposed. My understanding is Matt and Mike have had a conversation, and it was. I mean, the problem has always been has been two way traffic there. That's yep. right since it was built. It's been two way traffic issue. I don't remember any, any. I don't, yeah. Big events. I mean, it's took place. A lot of close lots calls. of close calls. I was going to say yes, but, but I mean, why wouldn't you just make it one way? I mean, t instead of closing it, why don't they just pick a direction and probably logically it makes, you know, one way to go from Central Street out, but. I guess, you know, we don't have a lot to say other than maybe make that recommendation, but that's kind of foolish to take and put that in the grass area and not give emergency vehicles access to that side of this facility. I mean, that's the auditorium on that side. So, huh. So, I think the topic was there for awareness that this was going on. We wouldn't allow this if it was a new structure. Zoning would require them to get the fire department to sign off and the fire department wouldn't sign off without an access. So, you know, I don't know. If we had a new structure, if we built a new structure and they had the road and they decided to just turn it into grass area, would they have to get a permit to do that? Uh. The reason I say that is because this has been on their permit applications because when they, I don't know if you were on the board at the time when they cut all those trees in front of the 
entrance to the or the guidance office in the yeah, on auditorium. The side, yeah, with, and they paved it over and put yeah accessible parking spots on the lawn. I would think from a because that was all part of that discussion that mm -hmm. time. I think it's in that permit. They uh, they really can get rid of it without a conversation before the zoning board. It certainly a, seemed to make sense. Like you're saying, if you built a new structure and conform to zoning where you needed a road, you wouldn't be allowed to I don't even think get that, rid of it. So. I don't even think it'd be zoning. I think that would be a state requirement that they'd have to have a build, they'd have to have a road all the way around. Yeah, I don't think the Department of Labor and Industry would, would allow that structure to have no road around it now. Right, but but given the fact that it doesn't have one, Given it doesn't, nobody's going to make it. In. Right, it's grandfathered that doesn't in. doesn't mean that you can make the situation worse. Correct. That's my, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I can't believe that they would get that. I, I can't believe the state would allow that. There's, I just don't see how um, that would be possible. Depends if they're told, right? I guess. But I think it, I, Mark, are you still hanging out there? Yes, I am. Can you pull, um, maybe tomorrow or the next time you're in the office, can you pull the permit that was issued to the high school for the, it would be where they removed the lawn and the trees and added uh, accessible parking spaces right in this area of road that we're talking about, I'm getting rid of, because I think they showed that road because there was a whole discussion at the on-site meeting about um, these folks backing out in front of cars going through that, that some of them have, you know, you take some people that are your more challenged drivers and have them back out into traffic coming around a blind corner. I'm pretty sure we had that conversation on site. I just don't know if it made it into the permit anywhere, but, cause that may be the way in to say, you know, this is part of your permit now. If you're going to change it, it does need to have a conversation, which is where yeah. your fire yeah. services get to weigh in. All right. Okay. Well, let's see where that one gets us. Further down the road. Yeah. We're not going to name the road out. anymore, though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's all part of their new, whatever, $12 million new school system built, huh? <laughs> that gorgeous. Um, draft revisions of the traffic parking and speeding ordinance. Speeding as in it's allowed now? Wherever you want. <laughs> um, so went through, pulled, there's some formatting issues that aren't reflected here just in the conversion from an older format into a newer workable one, but most of the changes certainly to content are reflected in red and or underlined. Um, there are a lot of markups on this first draft, they show a lot of um, just making the move to consistency among section headers, for example, um, so that they all look and read the same. There'll still be some additional formatting to make all the things line up. Sometimes when you get into track changes, it can get a little goofier and makes it a little harder to read when you keep trying to mm -hmm. change them. So those will go back and get later. Um, this is version one is how I would think of this one. Um, and maybe we'll send this one over to the folks at Orange County Sheriff's for their um, look over the ones we tasked with enforcing these things. Um, not too many content changes, got rid of some duplicative language um, or, and or made it a little more general in some places. When you look at the purpose, it was very specifically focused on speed. This generalizes it because we have sections on speed, sections on overnight parking, sections on parking limitations on Main Street and all of those different pieces. Um, and then have tried to add, so you can see, for example, more flexibility and or the potential for a uh, response. So I've added municipal or municipally authorized personnel, try to make references to law enforcement, generally say law enforcement. Uh, one of the issues we had, we have with the current ordinance is that it's very specific in mentioning a Randolph Village Police Department. Um, so we have an enforcement agency listed that no longer exists. Um, this does try to change that in a few different spots. Um, again, sections on speed limits, obviously no changes to the limits, just changes in, in presentation throughout. Um, 
and they broke out a section for section five. It's not new language, it just broke it out a little bit differently so it has its own home, um, traffic control devices. Um, again, just tried to create both consistency and or that, um, that ability to enforce it even if situations are a little different um, than they might be at the present moment. Policy question is we've got the two hour parking limit listed in here in this draft. That's a change from a three it's been out in the atmosphere a little bit about that change. There might even be some inconsistency in signage and practice. So it's just clarifying, do we want three or do we want two and whatever we want it to be? We'll dump that in here and then can make the signage match after that. Sections on loading zones had references to some, again, specific markers that probably made sense at the time, such as Bell Mains, loading dock at Bell Mains. Mm -hmm. That's undergoing its own metamorphosis. So we just attached that language to the address itself um, concentrated all the fine language in a later section and then during the overnight parking um, I've just tried to clean up some of the language designated law, municipal or law enforcement personnel um, are added in there rather than um, you know the department or police department mm -hmm. um, some of those are made more generic in on page this is the well, they're lines 138 through 141. I got to add page numbers to the draft. Um, just trying to clarify a little bit how we'll attempt to make contact and what happens if we aren't able to when it's winter parking ban season. So that we'll keep the practice from the current ordinance of trying to reach out um, to a vehicle owner who's left them in places they shouldn't be, uh, such as on Main Street but that after we've made that initial point of contact when they've been reminded that the ban is from you know, date X to date Y and in these times, that if they continue to habitually park um, where they shouldn't be, that we've got broader discretion just to tow those vehicles away. Um, used some language, sections five, six, and seven in that one. Um, looked at, for all of these, we looked at a few different other municipal traffic and parking enforcement related ordinances and some of the road here is modified um, to try to be a little more descriptive and capture um, exactly what we don't want you to do and what constitutes, constitutes those activities, particularly with the vehicle maintenance pieces. Um, so we modified this language that we boosted. I think in section five, for example, it actually came from one from up in Essex. Um, and so we try to also provide some provisions that um, if you're in an emergency situation, we're not going to, you know, jump up and down on you if you've got a real mechanical type of issue that forced you um, to sort of find a safe place to be off the street <coughs> or off to the side. Um, but it's not the place that you should be fixing up your car and putting the winter tires on yourself and changing your oil and all that. Um, same thing with unregistered vehicles, making that vehicles and or trailers. We've had issues with both that remain unregistered. In our municipal parking lots, public streets, roads, or at any town-owned property. So again, trying to hit a little bit of everything that we own. So that if we chase you off the street um, and we chase you out of a lot, you don't end up down at the park, for example, or, or at one of the trailhead parking lots. Um, and uh, commercial and, and personal vehicles, heavy duty, again, added the trailer there. Some more, um, just a little bit of clarifying language, moves the fines into Article 6. So for most of the fines in this ordinance, they're of a variety that we can sort of set and levy and they're taken through the Judicial Bureau. So those are listed here. There is a note in a table that for the speeding violations, those are set somewhere else um, through an, an applicable statutory process. I think I saw them posted on a judiciary website, for example, and the law enforcement officer has the discretion to figure out what those fines are based on the, the circumstance. Um, and the potential violation there. And then from there on out, it's just section headers giving adoption its own article number and then changing some language for additional consistency. So there's not a ton of policy content in there um, other than the two to three hour question in terms of how long, some clarifying language on what constitutes abandon, abandoned maintenance. Those are the conversations we have with vehicle owners on a granular basis. Um, there's no section in there about the vehicle full of Mountain Dew bottles, though, so that can still stay. That's gone. That lived out there. That finally went away. The green, super. Yeah. Chalk full of Mountain Dew. Um, 
And then changes the enforcement any, so that's a little more flexible, so that if for some reason something changes. And we try to add some flexibility in there. Some of the traffic ordinances, if for some reason we ever had regulatory personnel um, or ordinance enforcement personnel, they could take on some of the civil or ordinance-based violations in here. They obviously couldn't issue speeding tickets as, as a non-sworn officer, but um, that's the basic overview of those changes. It would try to address some of the stuff on Main Street that was the subject or the impetus for doing this draft mm -hmm. by providing those enforcement tools, particularly to law enforcement in this case. While we've also drawn maybe hopefully some clearer, brighter boundaries around what is and isn't acceptable for folks parking. Yeah. Doesn't mean we won't still have issues, but hopefully we have better tools to address them. Should we be mentioning the spaces that we've dedicated in like there's the parking lot on Pleasant Street that we put some spaces for Red Lion in there and they're going to be there overnight maybe more than a week I've heard they're a problem because they don't park where the signs are they park in the middle and then it's there for three four weeks and now the snow grows uh, but I'm just thinking you know if I grab new windshield wiper blades for example I'm, and I live there I'd probably change them in the parking lot you know Mm -hmm. That's kind of the minor maintenance. If we should, yeah, I think there's a number. Isn't there? Didn't we assign a number? Oh, my time. Can't I think it's six. Down. I think they have six parking spaces, and I think they're all the way to the back next to the fence. Was that done through an arrangement with our ACDC versus probably at the time they were yeah, putting they, together the permits to create that space and yeah, they have to have it, uh, it might make sense to go through the sort of the agreement protocol mm -hmm. to try to enforce that i mean you could you could always designate yeah. those spaces there um but it might be more effective to try to use the agreement as the lever um, unless we do want to take a harder line with it and work up to that either fine and or toe. I was just meant as an yeah. exemption, like if we have, um, oh, okay. or as, you know, these are, we exempt, like the, we mentioned the loading dock, yeah. we, you know, should we mention mm -hmm. that, you know, unless under a separate agreement or something like that. So yeah, so I see, I'm sorry, I missed that. 151, for example, that line right there, if we add it in there, um, uh, some language to the effect set uh, for vehicle owners, Parking in spaces under the um, the umbrella of an agreement with the town or something. So we, we'll figure out the right mm -hmm. ordinance language, but that kind of intent. You never know. They might go out there and change their oil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you may find it on the pavement too, but <laughs> <laughs> that would be a problem. But and the only other thing that I saw was I think that the hours on Main Street should be from seven to five instead of 7.30 to 4.30. I just still have businesses that are, you know, some of there's, I know that there's some businesses that start a little earlier. The beauty shop, I guess, on a Saturday morning starts early. You want the time to start so that you were... The cars were moved and, yep. you know, so somebody showing up at 7.30 has got a place to park, and which has been the problem, that's where this all started from, so. And then I think at least at five o'clock, and, you know, at that point, now you're competing with the restaurants that might be on the street, but it seems like you've got enough to cover that, but at least to go to five. And I think two hours is probably sufficient. Wouldn't think anybody needs to be there more than two hours. Unless you're having one good lunch. Somewhere. Yeah, one big lunch or maybe of beverages. After, yeah, because after five, it doesn't matter. If they're in the restaurant for the evening, that's fine. Okay. Thoughts? What do you think? Uh, two hours seems a little on the short side. You think it's short? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think three would be I more reasonable. Road, do you I mean, the, I think so. During the, the big, daytime from seven to yeah. from seven to I mean, five, the, you think the three big, hours? The big, or? the big impetus behind this is that we don't want people just parking there all day long. Right. Or so being there overnight and then being there exactly. continuously. Right. right. So Which is what two hours or three hours, it's not going to affect that at all. And we really just want to be able to focus on, you know, 
we know this person is parking here all day long mm -hmm. and we want to be able to enforce that they can't do that. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's two or three hours doesn't seem like it's really going to matter from their point of view. You know, Probably not. And then, but we would give other folks a little more leeway in case they come downtown and, you know, go get lunch someplace and then go to Chef's Market and then go to Rite Aid. Then sure. They I'm fine with that. It's just for more than two hours. Yeah, I'm fine with either. It doesn't, like you said. Does that work for enforcement? That's not. Does the sheriff have to actually go through and mark down that it was there and then go back in three hours and chalk the tires? Yeah. The signs say two hours. The signs say two hours. Signs say two hours now. That's part of the inconsistency. That's been the problem. So it would be less expensive to make it two to change the wording than to change the signs. <laughs> change the signs and just sand. <laughs> keep it two. Well, and keep fixing the signs. That. <laughs> yeah. I think I think it's still. I mean, that's a weak spot in the enforcement practice, just because it's the you have to have somebody 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 can chalk them and then comes right. back and I mean, right. so we're, we're not we're not going to be asking the sheriff to no. go around and check all the time to see who's there for right. two hours or three hours or four hours it's really because yeah. we're like that it's car has been there for two days well it's i think the they have time. they already have the plate numbers of all the right. offenders i can tell you that right okay. now okay and so <laughs> okay. we want we want we want to be able to say to them you're you're in violation you're in violation you've been here too long and you need to move your car it's the Correct. overnight parking really that's yeah the right yeah mm -hmm. right no, that's what's going so on it's the overnighters that are leaving them there during the daytime and affecting the merchants who have businesses there in the morning well, or people that are coming to work early getting the main street parking space and leaving at 5 5 30 when they get out so I guess the question is, are there people who are parking there, they're seeing the two-hour sign, and they're like, oh, I better go move my car no, after two hours. Probably not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You want to fix that problem, it's parking meters. I think they're ignoring me. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, maybe somebody from out of town, but yeah, anybody in this town looks at those signs and is yeah. all worried about getting a ticket. Do we know if any of the apartments where the presumably the offenders live have designated, I mean, no, do any of those no. landlords have designated well, park? Well, they can park in any municipal lot, too. Yeah, that's true. It, I mean, they just don't yeah. want to have to walk. Sorry. No, just, okay. This has been the issue for since I started, basically. <laughs> yeah. They don't want to walk. They can park in Pleasant Street. Mm -hmm. But then they got to yeah, come around. Cool. But, so am I right that one place that has no overnight parking signs is the Amtrak lot? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. But they can park here in this we, lot. Yeah, we, get, we let yeah. people park here Regular all the time. Regular questions about that. Yeah. And I let the sheriff's office know that somebody's parking in the lot, not to worry about it. They'll be here for a couple of days. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Just as long as they don't change their oil. So two or three. So a little bit tangential. Two and a half. <laughs> Something I've always wondered about with relative to downtown par uh, village parking is um, the market has the signs there that say parking 9 to 5 p.m. for our site only. But, but I those think are, that's because they, that's own, they, they own, own that. Well, they, they do own that? Uh, mm -hmm. Sam owns, owns that. Owns oh, those. he does. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and he also owns this, you know, the street behind or whoever is buying the building is probably going to end up acquiring the street Back behind, street. you know, beside the railroad track. Mm -hmm. Coming around beside coming, Merchants Row. Coming Back around, yep. Yeah, that's, yep. the town doesn't own that either. Okay. So, so this that, is really just about Main Street. It's pretty Merchants much Main Row. Street and Merchants Row. Yeah. And you know, if this doesn't solve it, then you know, next step I mean, is parking meters. I, I'd say if if it's not a big deal to change the sign, then make it three hours. And, yeah. And, How and, many signs are there? Oh, like two or three. I don't know. Yeah, it's not, not that. Not that, that it's not a big deal. I just Less I was just saying it was a consideration. Fine. Since we're, since we're <laughs> dealing with it, as yeah. Because well, it does seem like a more reasonable plan. Yeah. Of time. Okay. Fine. I'm good with that. Three hours it is. I'm not gonna find it hard to get along on that one. But once once we have this and we have the it in the ordinance written in a way that the that our that the sheriff can enforce it, this should take care of it. I would think. Right? Yeah. We'll be able to to tell people you're there for more than three hours. And you can tell them they can do a lot of things. Well, I mean, ultimately they can. They've all had warnings. They all know that. This, I mean, this group. This but hasn't. But hasn't the issue been that? The way the ordinance is written, it's the enforcement. The sheriff's department can't enforce this. Right. right, but after we change this, seems be, like they could. They'll yeah. be able to. Yes. Yep. That's what they told us. That's and the if they know who the offenders are, they can just put them on notice that this is the deal from now on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, 
you know, deal I'll with just it. Print out the ordinance and put it in the windshield. Right, because we can make it quite us. public, I'm sure. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. You can Facebook so that's it. headed over to Orange County. <laughs> yeah, I'll make the changes that we talked about here headed over there. And then um, if you think you're going to be ready at that point, and if they don't have anything crazy wild to talk about beforehand, we can move to a public hearing on the changes if you want. That would be one of the next steps. Mm -hmm. We can schedule that up. I think the timelines all work for the 11th of October still. Okay. Great. Good. Economic Development Director, Zoning Administrator position. I understand the idea, right? It's to have a conceptual conversation or at least a beginning conversation about separating the two activities from each other. So take your advocate and your regulator and figure out how to make them different people. Um, and there are different models to consider in doing that. Um, and so it might be, as we think about the budget process and moving into that cycle, um, what does that look like? And we've talked about everything from part-time zoning administrators, though having been through the hiring cycle and talking to many others, we're hunting for unicorns there a little bit. Is, is there a concern many? that there's a, I don't know, conflict of interest isn't the, um, isn't the word I want, but you see what I'm saying, that, that there's, they're inherently two different positions and they could collide I think in that's some circumstances. part of it, but then having had to sit in a zoning administrator's role, the other thing is if we want to hire somebody to be an economic development director, it helps to let them do that. The zoning is completely disruptive, even when you said at, office hours up people don't adhere to them so you're trying to do the customer service thing and take them as they come questions might be simple or they might be difficult or it might seem so simple and be difficult i want to put an accessory dwelling that's energy efficient of a certain size on the back whatever acreage of my farm so i can use it as short-term rental and house farm interns hey, that sounds laudable and a good goal and it'll be out of sight and it turns out there are a number of complications with that so then that person who's supposed to be working in a footprint with this thing it kind of crawls out of that box however it feels like whenever it feels like now you're still trying to manage what are those economic development activities so should i be seeking grants managing grants managing projects building relationships reaching out to business for help well that's harder to do if i'm trying to meet statutory deadlines to get something before a drp and so they really i mean there's a little bit of the there's the concern over that, that we haven't seen that sort of manifest in practice or anybody raise that as a complaint in a situation mm -hmm. as i understand it, going back to the beginning of the of the mashup a lot of the pressure is felt in having to do both um, simultaneously and so arguably are we getting the best customer service bang for the buck the best regulatory environment we can the best you know economic mm -hmm. development one as well and there are ways to combine that position with other organizational needs as well there are ways to share it amongst i mean all the ideas have come up from some sort of shared intermunicipal ZA, so we have someone in that role for 20 of the hours, and one of our or two of our neighbors take 10 and 10, and now we've got a full time position. We house them, handle all the billing, do all that, just as pro likely the larger town sort of in that model. You, there's somebody you hire that you the zoning component. Yeah, so some yeah. of the other models that are out there, there, you've got those, you've got a planning and zoning administrator, so somebody who does the land use planning and the regulatory pieces all together. That's a common model in other places. Um, some towns are moving toward an ordinance enforcement person, so it's somebody who would pick up the sign ordinance, the zoning ordinance, but might also pick up any public health types of pieces, might pick up you know, assisting with some of the animal control pieces, might if we have other nuisance ordinances, for example might help in that would become the E911 coordinator would take sort of all of these things that are out there and necessary and make those sort of the job. There are ways to combine, some communities have combined it with building inspection and tied that into fire services positions to try to get a little bit of everything. So there are a number of different ways to, to set it up. There doesn't seem to be an entity or an option to go out and say we want to simply straight up contract for this, for example, but Two Rivers is also exploring that. They sent a survey out where they think they're trying to figure out because everybody in some form is either looking for or likely to look for a zoning administrator, it seems like pretty soon. Especially in smaller communities. Yeah. 
it's a small pool in the best of times, and then a lot of the ones that have been out there are at that tenure and career, so I think you'll start to see retirements layered on top of sort of the scarcity, on top of mm -hmm. this broader need, and just about everybody has land use regulations, and if you're going to have those, you need the enforcement officer or the permit issuance officer. I mean, really think of it, calling it enforcement, the person who gives you the permit to do the thing. Well, there's a lot of staff time involved in, you know, mm -hmm. writing up those permits once they're filed and completed mm -hmm. and yeah. you know there's, so there's a lot of energy that goes into that you know when this situation was first came up you know marty was doing town engineering plus she was doing zoning and planning support to those two organizations and then you know we hired josh and josh's full-time role was economic development marty left that whole thing changed and so since it's changed it's i think it's been been a struggle it's at that point going forward because you know, we're not getting our money, big bang for the buck that we need from the economic development side of things. Mm -hmm. All we're doing is taking care of business in the zoning and planning office. Well, and ideally the economic development person should be helping a new business or a new development that was the, navigate through the process. That was the intent. I mean, and, instead of trying to do both things. Right. The only reason uh, we're doing both things is because Josh was willing to take that on for a while, hoping that we would find, you know, a person to replace him or right. replace that person, or replace Marty. Yeah. That didn't happen. And so, you know, we haven't been able then, you know, Adolfo took a shot at it. Trevor's taking a shot at it. And it's we're not we're not fixing anything here. We're just putting Band-Aids on this. Mm -hmm. So I think it's hurting us. Our, so we're, we, we budget for essentially Marty's old position still, don't we? Like... 20 or 30 hours a week for zoning? And no, the last couple of years it's been, um, I don't know exactly what the genesis of the split is, but it works out to 60, 40, 70, 30, somewhere in there, where we take the majority of the position's cost is in the economic development director's position, and then the remainder of the pay is in the zoning administrator piece. And at different points there have been a zoning administrator assistant, depending on where we've been at for a while. When Emery was in that role, that was what that looked like. You know? Have, have we had any even very preliminary conversations with any of our neighboring communities about? Not in this round. I think it's happened before, um, as I understand it. But. Mm -hmm. but shouldn't we be looking at where our needs are? Okay, so we know we know we need help with the zoning, mm -hmm. but we also have some pretty major road projects coming and some mm -hmm. some large water sewer projects coming. And Marty used to be the town engineer who would look at the plans and would do a lot of that type of stuff. And that seems to be missing in our puzzle right now, yeah. too. So it's almost like what we locked out with was Marty was hired and then she was actually had her PE and and had all these other skills. So she kind of became the tree warden for a while and the sign person and the, you know, this and that. Yeah, the 911 coordinator. And there was yeah. a lot of these little oddball pieces that she picked up that ended up making up a full job and so and she also worked part-time yeah well, she, didn't, she, didn't she was full-time for a while and then she went down in hours really, and then she went back okay, up a little bit i thought she was at like she, 30 hours a week mm, when she yeah. left she was yeah she was even. yeah she yeah. was 20 to 30. <clears throat> sometimes she worked a few more so so my, was my understanding on, was that when she left we were looking to fill that 24 to 30 hour a week hole and not try to fill a 40 hour a week full-time job and that was where we had gotten into trouble was that we weren't offering a full-time job yeah and so it seems like historically if we want to kind of get back to where we were where we have precedent for staffing that we could easily justify a 24 to 30 hour a week position for zoning and and these associated um, mm -hmm. um, tasks and then if we yeah, were to add in some of the ordinance stuff that you're talking about because we do pay for, like for health officers yeah. And do we, do we does, does Milo's the yeah, animal, does she get say, compensated for that yeah. also? Yeah. So if we could bring those into it and with the with the funds that come with it, it seems like we might be getting pretty close to funding a full time, full -time position, position. Yeah. that 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 we have in the sort of municipal organizational history of of, of doing anyway. And, and then we can go out and advertise for a full time job. And look at the skill sets you're asking for when he said you're looking for a unicorn. You're now looking for somebody who can support the planning commission, support yeah, zoning permits, go chase a 
a rabid yeah. dog. You know, but it seems like it would be. It would, <laughs> so I guess the message I'm hearing from the message I heard from Trevor though is that this will be easier to fill as a full time job than as a full time. Understood. I just we're, we need to look at kind of what we're putting together for job duties, and I and I would rather see us do some of the other ones, like the health officer one, probably because right they go to apartment houses, they're looking at similar things to what you're looking at when you do zoning. But you know, even some of the project side of these these major projects that we do, those those skills kind of all lend themselves to each other versus like the, the, the dog. The one thing yeah. they all have in common is there's a a permit and an enforcement component to each of them. They might be wildly disparate in terms of what <laughs> you know, dogs and health and new buildings, whatever. But I think position might at least it, there is at least a, a you know a kind of a permitting and a regulatory and an enforcement component that's common. And us and, 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 and an interaction with the public. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. And then, but Milo might be out in your dooryard trying to actually catch that dog. That's your neighbor's dog with no collar, no nothing on it, or a vicious mm -hmm. dog. She may be there with the state police trying to figure out how to actually capture true. it. So that to me is a different, really different position. You got to be a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, liking the risk mm -hmm. on that versus the others, I think, are all very common. And if you're just <clears throat> documenting a case, right, for a vicious dog or calling somebody up and saying, hey, your dog's barking too much. Can you do something about where you're hooking it? That, I think, all is the same as that when you get out in that where you call them and say, hey, I got somebody's dog here. I don't know who it is. But we're getting into, but, into budgeting season. Maybe we look into combining the ones which seem to make sense and, um, and putting it into our, our budget for next year. Trevor's got a little handle on that already, I think. Yeah, and just to, I mean, the different models, it, an area that you treat it on a, on a big one in terms of it would be to have that project um, all the way from sort of the scoping and the estimating on through the management end to have those capacities more readily available, to have that person put together some of the bid specs. Um, we're, we're, we're papering those things together. It's going to seem like a weird analogy, but stick with me. I don't, everybody remember the movie Major League from the 80s? Mm -hmm. There's an older pitcher on the team who, he's got no fast, he's got nothing in terms of what you think. He's got an emery board in his pocket and some Vaseline on his cap. He's throwing every piece of junk he can and he lasts as long as he can, does as good as he can. That's what we're doing right now. I'm, I'm Harris in this particular tortured metaphor. Time. And it we can make it for a little bit, but at some point we're going to need somebody who can yeah. go out there and do those other pieces. Let out of Vaseline. Uh, yeah. yeah, or they're going to catch me with the Emory board. You know yeah. what I mean? Like it's we're at that spot, and we. <clears throat> so That's at some form to get those would be. Come right out with the plans and yeah. meet with the contractors because we did it on yeah. Clay White Road. Mm -hmm. She had them right out, and she had her tape out measuring, and she was like, "Nope, this isn't going to work. You have not come out." You're out 10 feet, you're supposed to be out 12 feet. You know, it was, that's, we're missing that. And we're relying on the contractor to say, I did what I was supposed to do. Yeah. Here's the bill. Okay. Well, then the creation of punch lists, holding people to those. I mean, it just, yeah. we right. would get a better product out of it start to finish. You really need, a, need yeah. a project manager who can constantly look at these things. Yeah. Huh. You know, John's doing a great job, but he probably is not that person to be, mm -hmm. you know, doing that part of it. He's right. got a whole team to manage, not necessarily arguing with a sub or somebody like that. So so I'd be all for having you take a look at how to bring something together to get this to a full-time position again, because I really think that, you know, I think we're lacking in this economic development department, you know, and we have been, you know, said, you know, Pre-COVID, I thought we were making a lot of progress. COVID got in the way. Now we're kind of past that, and I really think we need to get back in here. And, you know, Mary struggled with this with her team, and, and I think there needs to be, you know, a lot more communication and, and, and a group of people that she can bring together to work with Mark to work on these different things that are out there. You know, ears to the ground. Who's Is there a new business that wants to come here? How can we help them? Um, those are the kind of things that originally when that was all envisioned, that was how it was going to work. I'm thinking that it'd be great if we can really
come up with a good plan for separating out the zoning and these other things that that really should be done by someone else and have the economic developer person really be able to focus on economic development. And when we get to that point, especially because at that point, because this is going to take a little while, um, Mark will have been in his role quite a bit longer and will feel a lot more comfortable and knowledgeable about the world that he's now living in. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I think we, it would be good for us to come back and have a discussion about what we would like to see him really focus on. Because um, my impression is that um, we could have three people in that role um, and, and, and be busy. Um, and so there seems like setting priorities and having um, you know, some direction oh, from, from the board might, might make sense at that point. Yeah, that might help us target some of those grant and project type areas too. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges, especially when right now is it's we're trying to wrestle this thing to the ground and back into shape when you lose the people and the historical knowledge and all those other things. Helps us sort of mm -hmm. get into that line, that smooth trajectory, and so that we can do those projects and do them well and manage the grants well, rather than right now we're in respond and react mode um, to, to a lot of those types of things. And then be a little bit thoughtful about what do we want to target, what do we want to target it for, how do we want to, want to go after it. And I, right, and, and there's, so lots there's a lot of opportunities. You know, I mean, we were moving down a pretty strong path on the recreational mm -hmm. side of things, you know, getting, getting the grant for the, for the trail system was critical. I think there's more of that kind of stuff out there. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, Joss was instrumental in helping with that. I think that's what Mark should be doing, you know, along with things like, you know, getting the money for, you know, what we went for the water system and those kind of things. That's really what that job, I believe, is where he should be at, along with, hey, you know, there's a business here that's wanting to come here, but they need something from us. You know, those are the things he needs to be communicating. And I, and I don't think you can do it if you're trying to do this zoning role. It, you can get, I mean, having, I don't want to speak for Mark, but having had those weeks in between in it, it, it was killer. Um, we tried to set hours up. We tried to steer it through a central hub. And, and then you can't always predict the complexity. It goes back to that. The simp what seems simple may not be. Mm -hmm. um, Trevor, in terms of the budget and where we're at for money, we've had a bunch of vacancies mm -hmm. that have presumably saved us some money in terms of mm -hmm. where we're at and budgeting for positions, would it be possible to use some of that money to advertise a position that we've been talking about just now um, before we get into the new year? We could, but I, I would recommend structuring it in a way that we get both, um, we get through a budget process where we say everybody's in agreement, we've figured out the right sort of dollar amounts for all these things. So we've got a budget and the voters have said, go ahead and do that. And so we're at that spot where the voters have said, as of July 1, you'll have these resources for that position. We agree with this idea. Yeah, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that. That, well, that also That's gets us through, through winter, um, which is where we have some variability in, in costs and expenses, depending on, on that. So that if we need, for whatever reason, there's a little bit of that type of cushion. Let's say you get into April, if you've got a really good look, you might be able to say at that point, we can jumpstart this process because we feel comfortable that these resources are there. Okay. We can bring somebody on at that point. And that's how you might be able to go kind of early um, in that. Okay. And it also lets us make sure we've got everything else in place that we need to be able that we can get sort of all the way back up and have our legs under us with, with the finance department in particular in that yeah. case. Okay. So I'm going to create a Marty-esque position. position is what I'm hearing as kind of the, of the concepts. That's the first one to take a look at. And so I think you're, you're probably good to add in the health officer role. Okay. For that, because that's a very similar function that they usually end up doing. And we'll give also some additional funding to go towards that. Not quite sold on the animal control officer one. Yeah, yeah I, I can see that's a little bit. You've made a good point. Theory that of that one. Um, separate. But I don't know what else is out there. Yep. I think that, that would be have. a good start and then see if we can find somebody, what their capacity is, what their skills and interests are, and maybe something else. Seems really obvious. Into it. Yeah. 
Um, the E911 stuff, for example, would be an easy, kind of an easy add. It's, mm -hmm. it's a relatively low time commitment. Right. We also have the emergency person. Yeah. Yeah, an EMD that had a little, you know, some component of that process that was sort of in-house or, or strongly tethered would help, certainly if there was an emergency situation. So in regards to Mark's role here, do we, how is, is there, so Mary's here and just curious, is there, collab, is there, is there collaboration going on between your group now and Mark? Is it started or well, where are we at? No, what is going on is Mark and I have had at least three meetings okay. um, in the last two weeks. And one has been around that grant for from the marketing and tourism regarding Randolph and Motion. Mm -hmm. And then he and I met just the other day, um, Wednesday. And we are we did a lot of brainstorming how we could help one another as far as the economic development. And so we're gonna start meeting on a regular basis, put a plan <coughs> together of how we're gonna, what kind of structure we're gonna have. Um, and so it's in preliminary stages, so we may need just the rest of the year and then go fresh beginning, beginning of the new year and then take a new round of members when you folks um, do appointments. So <laughs> I'm already thinking of those, you know, I have an outline, I just need to put it into motion and that's something I've shared with Mark and see how we can make it work. If we could do it before the end of the year, that'd be great, but you know, we need just to troubleshoot and brainstorm what we've started already. Okay. Sounds good to me. <laughs> we just we want a productive team to work with Mark, as well as how can we help him and how can he help us. Right. So it, I, I call it somewhat of a restructure. Yeah. So I, and I think this is opportune time because we have bylaws that have been written, are rewritten since 2015. Um, and you know how does that correlate to the economic development director's position, and how does it fit in with the council? So this is the time to do it. I agree. Sounds good. Okay. Next up, we're considering appointing a BLCT town fair voting delegate. Really exciting thing for a board member to experience. Nearly <laughs> <laughs> excited in your for your lifetime. <laughs> I would hate for any of you to miss this opportunity. Yeah. Um, However, knowing that you're busy, people, if you need me to, I can go to the business meetings and serve as the voting delegate. There's usually not too too much happening at that. You go through annual meetings of each of the insurance trusts. Um, Sometimes there are policy changes in terms of if there are bylaws or different practices. Sometimes it's about um, approving some sort of larger issue with the fund um, minutes of the prior year's meeting. That's one to look forward to. <laughs> and then there's the annual meeting at the VSCT level. That one can be a little more exciting. This year, I think, is a policy year. They switch their process up. The municipal policy is what becomes the backbone of the advocacy efforts, so there can be a little more conversation there. Some years it's quick and dull, and other years it gets a little spicy depending on who's there and what they're interested in. Low, well, low grade, we're talking low grade spicy. Okay, low grade spicy. Well, Tabasco. Got Tom Brady in play yeah. up there. Things ought to be yeah. rocking and rolling. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and there are other events if you're interested in attending town fair. There's uh, there are training and roundtable sessions. It's a two day event. You could pick one day or the other. There are other events with that that are we can get you information on and they're up on VLCT's website. So the annual meetings are no cost and they're open to whomever the delegate is. So it looks Anybody like you want to take that away from Trevor? <laughs> Not this year. <laughs> Maybe when I retire. It's the sixth of October. Yeah, annual meetings yeah. on that Thursday. Where is it this year? I'm Killing Killing Killington. 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 Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. I don't think I'm going to be in town on the same day. They've been bouncing between Killington and South Burlington. Yeah, usually it's... Yeah. Or yeah. sometimes out in Essex at the fairground. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well, I guess we'll... Want to make a motion to... <laughs> well, they, 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 I'll let you take it. Oh, gee whiz. Do you get to drive around a truck rodeo or... <laughs> <laughs> 
It, no, they took that event out of it. So they you, did? That happens at a different oh, time. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. That's that terrible. was... Uh, I thought that was a highlight of the yeah. event. Pretty much. Okay. Early June. Need a motion yeah. to well, appoint him. Oh, sure, I'll make a motion to appoint Trevor to the as the delegate for the town, <clears throat> VLC town fair. I'll, I'll, I'll second that, so... I'll it's your sentence. Second. All those in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 I'm bringing my bike if I get out early. Carries. All right. Appointment to the boards, committees, and commissions. So you have, have one to one. consider for economic development. Erica, who is, I saw her on the... Yep, she's right there. She's on the there. Zoom. So I think there was at least one vacancy on that committee. It's like Mary snuck out. There might be more than that functionally, but when I checked the other day, there was at least There's the one. one. I know for sure. But it's, the committee's not meeting right now, They're not right? not meeting currently, They're but right. this is why sure. she's in this reset mode. And yeah. so, but I think it'd be good to give her a first and who's certainly wants to be involved here. Mm -hmm. We have an email and packets from Erica explaining yep. interest and activities. Motion. I'll make it a motion to appoint Erica to the Economic Development Committee. And I will second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Were you here for a specific item on the agenda? Yeah, I was uh, wondering what was going on with the junkyard ordinances. I'm a Hebert Hill resident. And uh, winter's coming and the mess is. The mess is. Yep. It's a eyesore of the neighborhood. Is, okay. We never even heard it affected property values because of, it's a gateway to Hebert Hill. Mm. And yeah. the fences fall down, the trees die, more stuff comes, more stuff leaves. It's, this is the yellow place? This is the, yes, this is the place the, on the right going up the The right hand hill. side going yeah. up the hill. Yeah. Which we've uh, struggled uh, with. For a lot of things have been going on on that road. They're really looking up. And that's the gateway. Yeah. Yeah. We've yeah. been after this now for a number of years. Adelpho has had gone through previous conversations with the state. We've dealt with lawyers and legal stuff. And you know, we just keep running into this continuously big stone wall here. It's just we can't seem to get through it. And, you know, we've got another property in town that's similar to this, and we just struggle to see if we can, I mean, we're not getting any assistance from the, from the state. And uh, so we, I don't know what to tell you. But wasn't it. there an agreement on this one the last time? I'm not sure. There may have the, been, but it, there this, may have been, but. And it there was some improvement, but it wasn't a lot, if I remember correctly. And you know, if a, a junk prices go up. Some of the stuff will disappear, but by no means all of it. No. And, I mean, some of it's, like right now, there's an old big camper got hauled in there. And what are you gonna do with that thing? You know, it belongs in the dump. Mm -hmm. it isn't, there's no scrap value in it even. Mm -hmm. And then the cars, I got a feeling some of those cars ain't even on their property anymore. They've etched up the field. It'd be on Miles' property. And uh, I wonder about uh, the fluids running out of those vehicles and, you know, whatever. That's that's a thing of today to watch out for, you know. Is it a functioning business? Or no, it? it's just, a, it's just, it's just a, a, it's a, it's just a collection. And like you said, yeah. the junk prices go up, some stuff leaves, and then when the numbers come down, the stuff accumulates and it's. I'm under the impression if you give him something, he'll take it. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. People quit giving him stuff would be all right. Well, and that's where we run into a little snag here was, you know, now it's considered his personal property. So it, it, and it violates the ordinance. I mean, we, we've, not, we've known this. We've gone down this path here with him and Finkel. We're still working. And we're still fighting with that one. Well, he was in town. On yeah, oh yeah, this one exactly. This was in, this was in the village, and he moved out. It all up there. Yeah, got got a, some. I don't know what happened, but he got kicked off the property he was on, and then ends up on I don't know some relative's property up that there. That was her mother. Her mother, wasn't it? Yeah. Something. And the state's um, been back out there in the last eighteen months. I don't remember exactly the date, but the salvage yard coordinator did go out there, met with the people, talked about sort of what fit under their purview. So you may have seen some neatening up 
yeah, around well, that time and some loose fencing efforts, nice. but but it wasn't certainly cleanup oriented. I, I walk past there probably twice a week as we walk our dogs up Cupid Hill, and I couldn't tell if it was cleaned up or not. I mean, you know, yeah, no, it always looks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Over the bank, there's some it's stuff just, that fell, fell over there. It's, it's, it's pretty shocking. Looking. And somebody's right now is doing some work on the other side of the road. Yeah, there's somebody like, doing some excavating. Some yeah, it looks like a yeah. couple of lots are going in there. Yeah. Well. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I guess all we can do is we can pull the file and see where it ended up. Um, and look at it. If I remember correctly, they did. They had more unregistered vehicles than what was allowed. But they said something about they That's always, ran always them in cars. some competition, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Some yeah. all this personal property thing competition. That they weren't. So some they were. Years. They got in under the hobby Two. piece on that. Wow. But I think um, if I remember correctly, photos were taken the last time, so we should be able to take some more photos and have a comparable to know mm -hmm. that more has come in or what more has come in. I've also seen a bear crossing the road quite often, just <laughs> just over the hill at 10 o'clock in the morning. Maybe That's Trevor, a big bear. Maybe you can see if the states, just to follow up and see where they were at. I don't know if it's last. something yeah. the bear's after too or what. Well, I understand <laughs> Place to sleep. The, the state doesn't really want or have the time to work on these small problems. They're big for us, but they're small at the state level, and they're pretty low down on their list no, of priorities. I, I and then locally, could. we don't have good tools to to force compliance with our ordinance. But they just don't exist. And, we don't even, yeah, you can't really, create the tools. Right. We, it's, it's something that really needs to happen as a legislative state yes. system. Yeah. And I've been... And I put in a bill last year <laughs> to fix that. this, but it, it went to GovOps, which was a little bit busy with redistricting and pensions. <laughs> and so they didn't get to it. But I'm going to um, really try to make sure that it gets um, looked at this year. I was like, well, and find a few other sponsors positions. because I'm sure we're not the only community it, directly. Yeah, no, exa exa exactly. This oh, is a Brett statewide. A this is a statewide. statewide. Issue. Every, everybody I've talked to is like, yeah, we have these things going on in our communities and we don't know what to do with them either. So yeah. it, it might be a good time to really look at some sort of a statewide. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You're our guy. Yeah, no, I really want to. I really would like to see this. I really yeah. like municipalities have the have the the tools they need to enforce well, these. I don't know that it's municipalities. Municipalities don't have the money to fight some of these. You well, know, and, and you talk to the, Brookfield about how much they got into that one on fourteen. But, yes. So my understanding is that and they win, and there's nothing we, they can do. We can, we yeah, we can. We can issue citations. We, we daily. can issue citations, but every day. But then they don't pay them. Correct. And we have no way to make them. Nope. Pay them. Nope. Because so, so the 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 legislation, the bill that I had drawn up last year, would have given towns the authority to treat unpaid um, fines of these of these nature um, in the same way that we treat unpaid water bills or tax bills. So that if somebody doesn't pay, we can we can bring them to tax sale. Well, um, who's going to bid on them? I mean, well, you'd be surprised. honestly, well, like some of these the are, that case, one in Brookfield if, is if somebody, on contaminated some, land. The worst case scenario is, is also unfortunately, is that the, the town takes it over, but at least it gets cleaned up. Yeah, But, but that's going to be the worst case scenario no matter what. I mean, yeah. So, but, but at least we get it. Well, yeah, and that's what needs can, to happen. You, you know, I think you're on the right track. You, need, you know, the state the town to, cleans it up, and then yeah. the town. But can, you need to have the authority from the state the to be able to go do it. You just need that piece of legislation that gives the towns the right to, you know, go in there and do that. You know, years ago, Barry did Barry Town did this at the dugout. Yeah. <laughs> it's when it were the loaders and the dump trucks. Am I correct? By there lately? Uh, no, that they actually, hung it up there lately, but they cleaned it up once. After, that was after Irene, and yeah. they got it bought out with. <clears throat> Is that what happened? They got bought out with funds, so they got to be able yeah. to clean it up. Yeah. yeah. But you know, some of these, the, I mean, that we could talk about this in a different venue, but. In Brookfield, the, the land that they got the problem on is the same one that's contaminated by the dry cleaner. 
that dumped all their yeah, refuge the universe, there. Was there universe. Universe. Like Brownfield? Oh, yeah. And yeah. now they wow. pile all these cars and all kinds of stuff on top of it. But the town doesn't want the land. And they've won in court three or four times, but they can't enforce anything. They can't even enforce the court order. Right. And they don't want the land. The judge said, well, we'll give you ownership of the property. And they're like, no, no, no. It's all contaminated and whatnot. We don't want that, too. It's a right. mess. Right. So, so like it may not be a one-size-fits-all no, in all scenarios, but start, in some of them. Start with at least being able to enforce our ordinances. Make brownfield money eligible for towns to use to clean it up. And it might count something, too. Yeah. Well, if, it's owned, if it is owned by the municipality, there are additional funding sources that are available than if it's a private. But in this case, some of the neighbors even offered to buy this property and it didn't happen. Okay. I mean, yeah, I mean, and there were some pretty substantial resources to, to be able to buy it, but mm. still not going anywhere. So you can't even buy them out. So, no place to go. Yeah, that's the problem. You buy them out by putting them. All you can do is move it down the road or up the road or someplace. To a different yeah. town. Yeah. It's going to go. Happened. It's not going to. It's okay. right. It's what happened before. Well, if they make that offer, tell them a different town. Yeah. <laughs> make that contingent, right? <laughs> All right. Thank you. Well, anyways, it's it's been on our radar screen for a long time. Okay, keep it there, please. Yeah. Well, I drive by it too. I see it every time I go to my son's house. Yeah. And shake my head. Oh, I drive by it every day. Yeah, I know. Sometimes it really raises the hair. Yep. I agree. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Have a good evening. It is um, quite a nice sort. Yeah. yeah. So now we have uh, item J that was added to the East Randolph Hall in defining how to approach that to okay. figure out roles, responsibilities what it is, where it goes. I think it's some of the challenge here is that, that we don't have a priority system, right? So if we looked at all the buildings that the town owns, we don't have, we haven't finished the priority model that would, we would plug in all the projects and see where, how that ranks. So it's fair to say it's not a project, but it's not fair to say we're, we don't know where it would come out if we were to have some type of priority ranking. How would you arrive at priorities? Through a ranking system. Yeah. And, and how would that ranking system be implemented? Well, John, that's a process that we would need to, need to go through, we but we don't have it. System. We don't, we don't have, have it for our roads either. We started, we started down, down that path, path but then we, then we had other fires, fires that we had to put out. Um, How many town buildings are there? Too many. <laughs> well, you gotta remember, Ownership-wise, Chandler and the library both fit into that model too. Yeah, so you got, and you got the town hall, and you got the this two one, garages. Two, two garages, two fire stations, water wastewater plant. I mean, there are smaller buildings too, such as the one out at the landfill. But you've got camp building, pool building. Um, are there any of those buildings that you can't use? You're using that building. All our buildings can be used. There's twelve. Except for the hall. Well, you're using the hall. It's just limited. Most of those other buildings are everyday spaces, though, in some form. I mean, Chandler's a different animal altogether. But yeah, Chandler's yeah. its own thing. But the camp building's used every day for four months with kids in it. Um, the the pool building's used every year. Yeah, same thing. This building's obviously used every day. Landfill building's used every day. Garages are used every day to support the other functions and to provide the other programs. So they're... They're, they're different animals at a certain level in terms of what you use them for. Mm -hmm. the fire stations or emergency services that right. need to be able to be used when they're needed. 24-7. All, all of those activities you, you describe, uh, you know, they're all centered around the village itself of Randolph. And, and, and all the things that you're describing aren't within a 20 minute drive of East Randolph. 
So how how does East Randolph fit into the uh, priorities of the town as a whole? I mean, there's there's from from what I can see as a taxpayer here on in the East Valley, there's very little attention paid at all to this side of town. Oh, we I don't know if I necessarily go along with that. You get snow plowing, you get road work to get done, you've got a fire department over there. I don't think I'd quite go that far to go. I told well, you, I, John. I, yeah, I, I, well, I, I, I'm I, just saying it's like you know everybody. I certainly disagree. I, I certainly disagree with you, Perry, and and you know I'm I'm fine just just dis, dis, disagreeing with you, but uh, th there is there is nothing approaching the activity on the on the east side of town as there are on the west side. It's the higher po po population on the west side. There's no argument, but uh, you know on this isn't point. Siberia. Well, I'm not seriously true. Let me, I, I'll give you a little history lesson, John. I grew up over there. That's where I was first started my tenure in the town of Randolph when I was born over in that region. And it hasn't changed much in the last 65 years. It's just the way it is. We're divided by a mountain here, and the major population of the community is over here on the west side. So hence, we have the West Randolph comments, and we have the East Valley comments. So, you know, but I think as far as you know, services and things like that, you know, you guys are getting your, your roads taken care of, you're getting the roads plowed. Um, you have a fire department over there that we've supported, you know, pretty well here over the last however many years. So I'm not quite saying that we're, you know, we're ignoring you over there. There happens to be this issue of the hall, and that hall situation has been that way for years also. And I understand now that, you know, we've got to try to do something with it. Um, but what are the what are the uses that you want to do with it? What how is it going to generate revenue, or is, or is it going to generate revenue, or is it just going to be a building that gets? I, I don't know. I'm hearing big numbers here. You know, two and a half million dollars. You know, to to renovate that place and lift it. You know, it seems like a pretty pretty big stretch to get the rest of the taxpayers to, to buy into it. And it's like I said in the meeting. You know, if you can if you can sell that to them, then so be it. But we have to also look at what the bond priorities are. So yeah. just 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 a comment about the dollars, Perry. Um, you know, two and a half million included all the options and the bells and whistles that um, you know were were put forth right in the study that 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 was done. The reality is to get the building open, to get the foundation taken care of, to address the fire marshal's issues, the code related issues, the structural safety, and the the initial building longevity issues we're we're talking at something around eight hundred fifty thousand dollars okay so eight hundred fifty thousand bucks do you think that that's a i'm having a little struggle with that one eight hundred fifty thousand bucks you could probably build yourself a new building okay for a lot less money that would be up to code and would be you know a, a better space i'd hate to lose the historical value of this but you know, unless you've got, you know, a donor in your back pocket over there that wants to kick in a lot of money, I, I just don't, I'm having a struggle with that. And then that's why initially when we started this conversation, you know, three or four years ago, you know, Preservation Trust worked with the town of Brookfield and I sent you guys up there to see what Brookfield did. And so that's, I'm still on that tangent here that, you know, it's got to come from those kind of sources. Perry? Yes. Brookfield's not owned by the town. Is a whole different scenario going on here. Number one. Number two, though. number two, we are more than willing to help where we can help. But we are not running this project. It belongs to the town. But I don't think the town's the one, Betsy, that went out and created this project. And I, we had this conversation of, we, we aren't even really sure why Mel pushed so hard for the town to own this building, other than it was a conversation about eligibility for grants and and part of that. But, you know, if there's somebody else that'd like to own this building, we definitely will consider transferring ownership to them. If there's a, a group that wants to have the exact model that Brookfield used, you know, we're willing to go that route. I, I just think that we really need to figure out what this project is and whether it's a priority or not and where the town comes in on it. I don't, you know what, I don't know that I'm ready to commit resources, whether it's labor hours or money on a project that I just don't, isn't really defined. And 
Perry's right. We sat there and we listened and we, we've heard the numbers. They've been all over the place. 800,000 is the lowest I've heard and I haven't seen what that scope looks like, but I don't believe you're gonna get out of that for 800,000 on that building. As I think that's one of those that once you get into it, there's a lot more rot and a lot more problems than what fills up. Trini, Trini, that's only to deal with, it's not anything cosmetic, nothing frills, it's not changing entranceways, it's only dealing with ADA and the foundation. And it really, those figures are, like John said, he's, he, he's very, very close. I came up with something similar. I was a little bit less, but we're right in the same ballpark. Looking at the figures from Breadloaf and looking at some of the other pieces. I really am hearing the town isn't interested in this project and restoring this building. That's the current select board is not interested in it in it right now. It may be somewhere down the road and we'll still be a committee and it may still be a committee that wants to help. In the meantime, I have a question for you. Did that sound right, by the way? Is that where everybody's at? Well, I wouldn't say exactly that way. But it's just the numbers have, like I, like I said, they, they, we're hearing a lot of different numbers from what we heard initially. You know, I mean, I'd heard numbers back in the beginning. It's like, okay, you can't use the building. You're not allowed in the building. The fire marshal says this is what you got to do. And somebody came back and said it's going to take a half million dollars to fix it. Okay, so then, you know, going down that path, that sounded, okay, that's kind of reasonable. But then as we dig deeper and deeper and we get into these, you know, scopes of work and all these, you know, architect involvement, and then we find out, oh my God, it's two and a half million dollars. If that's the wish list, well, maybe that's a wish list for for 20 years. I don't know if it's a wish list to get you into the building now. I mean, what do you, you, know, you guys are holding bingo in there, correct? So, so the fire marshal has given us permission to hold, the fire marshal's given us permission to hold uh, groups on the upstairs level for, not more than 60 people for sure and yeah. 50 is better but not more than 60. we had to have a porta potty and we had to have the handicapped parking places and the ramp for people to get in that's all temporary i don't know how long the town and the fire marshal will allow us to continue that way uh i didn't know until recently, when I was talking with the fire marshal, that we could have other things besides bingo there as long as we stayed within the structure of, it's a town advisory committee that is putting a yoga class together, as an example. But it's not the town advisory committee that's doing that. It's the, it's the East Valley group that's doing that the same as it is the East Valley group doing the bingo. As an advisory committee. Not to the town. You're not doing those as an advisory committee to the town. You're doing those as your own standalone group. Uh, that's correct. But the reason we could use it is because we are a town advisory committee. Am I right about that, Trevor? I think what we're digging at a little bit here is that in order to raise funds through the bingo effort for the efforts, those run through the group, which is an independent entity. If there's an advisory group that the board put together and formed, that's where the advisory <coughs> entity is. And so a legislative, that's a public body under the open meeting law. That's the distinction, whereas the other one's a nonprofit and or other status. I haven't seen, the only thing I've seen from Maurice was related to bingo in terms of the usage and we set up the parameters with some dates around that and some of the other other requirements. So if there's something newer from him, we can take a look at that and see how these distinctions play out. But Okay. Does that have a timetable on it? Is that is that 
I assume you guys talk to each other. I apologize. Well, I'm assuming. Did, so did we have? Is that what you what you got, Maurice? Is that was there a time limit on that? Is that just for six months or a year? Or does it got to be revisited? Only, not the winter months. I think it's October. The okay, we have a yeah. the use agreement that we set up that we all signed yeah. that was stemmed from that conversation that we did have all together, in some form. But we don't always get looped into the same thing altogether. So that could be the gap. So what's the next step of, of what you would need to continue to do that or to expand the number of people in the building? What's got to be done there? What, what's he looking for there? I think at some point it's going to have to be those permanent improvements. Some of these, why there have been the allowances, especially for the bingo events, is to help raise money in support of that, of that effort. Of that effort. They generally match up with a weather window that's a little bit better so that you can get away with the portalettes. Get a little more daylight, ease of access. You know, there's some method to that madness in terms of the why that time of year versus January, for example. Okay. But I don't know if this is in every single year, unless or until something happens, are we able to do this at a certain level? We have followed their discretion as the life safety and public safety well, professional only, in the loop. Yeah. Because that helps us with our insurance concerns, with our safety concerns. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And my only thought with that was to go along with, with the whole keeping it in the town's mind that somewhere, maybe a year or two down the road, they'll say, well, why don't we get this building fixed? I, to go I, back to the two distinct entities where you're yeah. going to get into a problem is if you're raising that money as a town committee, the revenue of that needs to come to the town to go into the fund for the building. Mm -hmm. If you're raising it as your East Valley group, not part of the town, then the money goes into your account to do what you want with it. So you can't represent yourself as a town entity and then keep the money you make. The, the agreement is with the group, if I'm remembering the language right. So for the bingo pieces, at least, it does tie that way. Mm -hmm. So the question is whether we want to commit somebody to sit down and to find a project and roles and responsibilities and I don't know that we're ready to define a project. I mean, how are we gonna pick? I mean let's let's think long term with this. I mean this 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 isn't something that's gonna be fixed overnight, but without some kind of com commitment from a personnel from the town that can provide us with some professional assistance, we're we're really gonna get nowhere. Yeah, but you've been on the call tonight and heard that there's some, we don't have enough staff hours right now to do the, the mandatory stuff. Is that going to be a permanent condition? Or is that something that can, you're working actively to improve that? I mean, you I could listen to that. You can improve that. However, you know, uh, there is a problem with the labor force out there right now. And so it's a little hard to find people to take on these roles. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm well aware of what's happening in the labor market, but the, okay, I mean, well, to, to follow that's... that logic, to, 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 to follow that logic, you, you would arrive at the conclusion that the town's never going to take on anything new. I don't know if I quite go that and far. No, that's not the case. Well, we've got some well, projects right now that are slipping because we don't have the staff hours to get them out, and those are roads and water sewer projects and you know more of the the you know main infrastructure of the town <laughs> yeah that's a struggle you know the phone calls i get john regarding what's going on around town would probably not shock you but you might not realize how many of them i get like you know how come the cemetery is not mowed and you know geez you know I'm, we're having this funeral and i've got to you know Got to get the cemetery mode. Who's going to do that? And are they going to get it done before June 10th? Are we going to get it done before July 5th? So I get those kind of phone calls. I get phone calls when, you know, your road doesn't have enough sand on it or where we're spreading gravel on the road, those kind of things. And so these priorities, 
you know, all get stacked up. And, you know, the, the, the goal here is to provide services to the community, which I think we're doing. And this is a project when it initially came about, you know, I thought it was a great project. I didn't realize it had quite the price tag to it. So, you know, from a business standpoint, does it make sense to date, dump $850,000 into that building? Um, I don't think so, because I think you could build something for a lot less that would serve the purpose. It just doesn't have that historical piece to it. <laughs> but 850 yeah, but you got to get you anything. down, too. Don't forget that. Oh, I understand. You've got to knock it down. But you're not going to get that 850 okay, is only right? step one. You're still going to get to the two and a half million. I, I, it's I, just I just be in somehow you're going to get there. I mean, I, I just, I'm just having a problem in thinking that, you know, this is a <clears throat> Two and a half million dollars. If you decide to take the building down, try to save the uh, stage curtain. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't think we're anywhere near taking the building down right now. Uh, you know, I'd just like to put some band-aids on this for a little while, and that's why I'm asking: is you know, how long is your agreement with the fire marshal? Could that be extended? Is is what's the next step going to cost? Is the next step a fifty thousand dollars step, or is it a hundred and fifty thousand dollars step? You know, can we stage? You know, can we stage this out? you know, over a number of years to get to the point where, you know, things are changed around here a little bit. Yeah. And, you so know. When you yeah, look at yeah, the, yeah, a the, structure. The, 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 answer to, the answer to your question is yes. It is, but it is because if you're going to, you got to make a decision now what you're going to do to that building. Because the first step is going to be to raise it and put a new foundation in it. And remember that night they said one of the options was to add another eight inches to have more clearance downstairs. Yeah. Which if you're going to do that, That's that changes your whole, Yeah. that changes all your structural supports, mm -hmm. changes all your beams, all that has to change. So you got to make the decision today how far down this path you're going because your first phase of your construction has to know what you're doing. I totally agree. Absolutely. And so you can't just put a foundation under it now and move forward and then in a few years say, oh, let's add that eight inches to it. You can, but it's going to be yes. a nightmare. Well, and you need to have a sense of, a better sense than I've heard uh, thus far of what use you're going to put the building to and how far do you have to go to make that use possible. and. Frankly, how frequent is that use going to be to justify yeah. any hundred and fifty thousand dollar expense or whatever the expense is going to be? I mean, bingo is great. Maybe a, a local theater, whatever is envisioned to be in there. The building yeah. needs to be able. And what revenue is going to come out of that? Exactly. Right? Like you've got ongoing operating costs. Is the town going to take on? all the additional operating costs, or is there gonna be some expectation that there'll be a certain revenue stream that's going to... Oh, absolutely, and, it'll like, be rented out, yeah. Well, but we don't know that, we haven't... But to whom? Well, that, right. well, that would be my marketing plan. <laughs> yeah. Right, but we don't have a, you know, that's part of it. Like, what does that look like? Who are the entities that are willing to rent it? And what are they willing to pay and how often are they going to do it you know once a year to to do a craft fair isn't enough but is there like you know, somebody who wants to do health classes or you know exercise things or kids crafts on saturdays or you know and a lot of those you know, they look for you not to charge right they're looking for public use buildings that they don't have to pay for because it's usually gifford or the school or somebody underwriting those so it's yeah. there's public it's there's buildings you can use and you don't have to pay for there are. if mm -hmm. i wanted to do a craft class where can i do that in randolph and not have to pay for it you can't because you're a person but if you were the school wanting to do it, or you were Gifford or somebody like that, they can get into a lot of these facilities without a fee. Yeah. Well, there's a there's more market out there than there's there's a lot more market out there. But um, I mean, you bring Brookfield as an example. They they don't do it in the winter time at this particular point, but they can stay pretty busy. Oh, they're, they're getting, they seem to be getting a lot of use out of their model. There's no doubt about it. And, 
they are limited to their seasonality. I, I that, that I do know, but because I've run into some heaters on occasions for early spring events and, and late fall. So, um, but I know that you know they secured a lot of money from individuals and preservation trust, and so you know whatever they did, you know they raised a lot of capital that way, and that went a long ways to getting them to where they are. I don't know what the condition of the building was when they took it over, and how much work they had to do, or how much they needed to spend. But I know it's a pretty substantial amount. Well, I personally don't want to start going and asking people for donations, and nothing happens. I'm, I'd be very ashamed of that. So. Oh, I think, yeah, you, you don't want to do that until you actually have a plan of action. Until I, know yes, until I know that there is a plan and it looks reasonable to for a town situation such as Randolph's. I'm not sure, Betsy, that you're hearing that the town's going to take the lead on developing a plan for how to make this project go from where it is today to a, you know, five-year, ten-year plan of two and a half million. Because I don't think the town's sold yet that it's a project that we want to put as a top priority. I think somewhere there's got to be that interim step of sitting down and defining what this really is and and what it looks like. And, you know, there was a whole conversation about a business plan and part of a business plan is scoping out what you're doing. It's not just finding uses for it. It's, it's defining your purpose and need and what that looks like and what you want to, you know, what's your end goal and what, what do you have today and how, you know, what's it going to take to get there and then what, you know, what your ongoing costs, all that is it's, it's got to be broken into smaller phases, more manageable things. Yeah, probably. I mean, you know, coming up with a pro forma budget um, would be a good start of what, you know, let's just say theoretically you got it in a situation where you could use the building for any use you wanted and, uh, you know, meeting all the fire codes and everything else and, and forgetting what the cost is at this point, but just say, okay, now we've got a building we can utilize. What are we going to do with it? What's it going to cost to take care of it, heat it, maintain it, those kind of things, and what, what's our revenue sources? So that would help me an awful lot to, to figure out, you know, where that's going. Let's just take out of the equation, you know, what it costs to fix it. Let's just say that that building was ready to go, and this is what we could do with it. What would we generate for revenue, and what would our expenses be? That would be my first concern. Can, is it sustainable? Can it take care of itself? And if it can't, what are you asking? Yes, the then, yeah, if it can't, then what are you asking? Yeah, what, are you, what are we asking the taxpayers to pick up? You know, we, we have an arrangement with Chandler, and, you know, we pick up a portion of the heat for that, but they pretty much take care of all the minor maintenance, and then when they need to have a major maintenance issue, we're, you know, called out on the carpet to come help figure out how to solve that problem. <clears throat> so that's the Chandler situation. Yeah. And I, I can tell you from personal experience, having headed Chandler for two and a half years, that um, it's an organization that constantly struggles with sustaining itself um, in, in a very, very uh, difficult fundraising and development and even grant writing environment. And unfortunately, and I, I think this is true for similar organizations statewide, um, COVID made that even more difficult. So um, if, if you're going to develop a fundraising and a long-term strategy for sustaining the, um, the community center, the, if you go that route, you're gonna need to be very, very conservative about what kind of revenues you can generate, including from fundraising and development, as well as, as you suggest, you know, renting the facility and so on. It's a very, very difficult environment, and it's made even more so by the fact that this is a rural, predominantly working class and middle class community, and, and the 
financial resources are just not there. How can we get some visibility into the budgeting model that uh, Chandler uses with the town? Chandler doesn't. Uh, Chandler doesn't provide us any of that. I, I mean, I'm. It's a good question. You could ask, but you know, they don't. We are not privy to their budget information. The only thing that we end up getting asked to do is when they, <coughs> a, a, what is considered to be a major repair, then you know we're asked to you know to contribute to that repair. But the rest of the stuff that goes on there is there as their own entity. They basically just have a lease agreement. So. So that. Is, is that a common building? Pardon me? No, that's not. How is that? Why is that odd, Ben? Is it a well, town-owned town building? building? It's, it's a town-owned town -owned building, but the organ, the Chandler is its own separate nonprofit organization that leases the building from the town. Well, they lease it? Yes. Oh. <laughs> For yeah. not much money. For <laughs> None. For negative money. For negative money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not and not that we had anything to do with that. Okay, but you know it. It's it's a situation that's been there for twenty some odd years. And the town subsidizes it to the extent that we pay a portion of the heating oil costs, and that's about it. And uh, so yeah, we pay a lot more than that. Well, bond, the bond payment. We pay for the we, bond. We, well, we yeah. have a bond payment also that we're covering. I'm talking about that. You're right. I was just about to mention yeah. that. Oh, okay. that there's a $750,000 uh, bond that the taxpayers voted to take on 20 years ago when the renovation and modernization project happened. And but at the same time, they also raised one point something million. They, right? they raised they raised one and a half or two million. One and a half. One and a half. The million. whole project was about two point two five million dollars, uh, and seven hundred fifty thousand of that came from a taxpayer authorized bond. So, you know, you know and that was twenty years ago. Yeah, and they, they launched a campaign. I don't know. Took them a couple of years to raise the one point whatever one point five. So, um, well, I guess we'll go back to Trini's question and where you're all at with the renovation of this building at this particular point. Didn't ask that question. Was that the first question? Yeah. No. No, the question was how do we get a definition of what this project is? And what we're and what we're actually being asked if we support or not. Right. I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what we're asking for is is a pretty comprehensive pro forma that shows what your vision for for the center is, how you're going to raise the money to make it happen, and more critically, how you're going to sustain it once it does happen. Um, you know, you know, I would think that way if I owned the building, but I don't. We don't own the building. Well, Chandler doesn't either. Chandler what do you want it to be. Ch Chandler doesn't. Do own, Chandler doesn't own its building either, but that's the way it. And Chandler came in and wanted to renovate. They came to the town with a plan to get buy-in right. on what they wanted to do and how what their plan was and actually made quite a bit of progress before, I believe, before they asked the town about bonding. bonding. There wasn't, I don't think. It's been around for so long, I don't know how. Well, the organization I mean, itself yeah. wasn't. I mean, you know, back in the, the, I would say probably in the late 70s, early 80s, you know, there wasn't an entity that, that really dealt with it. There was a handful of people that basically had taken on the responsibility of it and, you know, had booked some shows in there, but the place was in pretty big, you know, it, it was in shambles, it was disrepair, the seats were in bad shape, the walls were in bad shape, ceilings were in bad shape, and I believe it was Red Hard, Red Hardigan and Irma and some of those folks, the Drysdales and Martha Oslin, and so they kind of just came up with this similar to what you guys are doing. They, they put together a group and put together a proposal to the community and primarily, I guess, the select board at the time and said, okay, well, this is what we need. If we can raise this much, would you do this much? And my understanding is that's how the deal went down. And they, they put in their sweat equity and, and 
rejuvenated the place and then put on the big addition out back. So that was all part of that 2.2 million or 2. Point whatever it was, 2.5 million dollar mm -hmm. renovation project that they went through. And so they've been tasked with, you know, taking care of the building and, you know, using it to do what they they're currently doing with it. So I mean, that's that's how that came to be. And not everybody's, you know, sure. not everybody's warm and fuzzy about this. You know, there's still a lot of people that call me up and ask me why we're paying the heating bill, but that's the deal. So, <laughs> so it's a little more than thirteen thousand a year. How much is it? Thirteen to, to insure it, just to insure the building. Yeah. So, so we do that fuel oil and the in insurance the fuel oil and the bond, right? Just, just, just south of eighty for the yeah. For fiscal I was going to say it's about seventy-five, from what I can recollect. Yeah. So that I mean, it, it you know there is a value there. Um, if you guys could make that kind of a case, and that's the kind of programming or whatever you think you can do over there, and show that to the to the community, and we can sell that to the community, then you know I think you got a shot at this. I think I said that when I was there at the meeting. It's like you gotta you gotta figure out how to sell this to the rest of the community. We're just the guardians of, of the ship, so to speak. You know, so. So Trevor, can you find out from Maurice where he stands now with any future use after we get done bingo in September? Whether he thinks that can continue another year or how much can it can be used? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll reach out to him. It, it'll fit with everything fit in. else in the in the in the punches, and I'm not trying to put anybody off. I'm just trying to be really honest about capacity. Like we'll, we can get it out, but okay. If he's if if the fire marshal is allowing, you know, he's put an end date on this, allowing the bingo operation to. I mean. Why can't that just be extended? Um, well, sometimes they will, but you can yeah. remember that some of the challenge is rot, and each mm. year it gets a little worse. Okay. And so eventually they're going to be like, no. Yeah. You know, no go until something happens. Yeah. Yeah. But right. I think they put an end date on it for two reasons. First off, the heating season. Right. And there's like no insulation and some broken windows or cracked windows and a lot of challenges with that. But it also allows them to come in in the spring and do another inspection before they yeah. before they make any commitments. My guess is Maurice is going to tell you that he'll inspect it in the spring and let you know whether there's any use that season or not. Uh, I don't know if more. Yeah, Maurice might not be here in the spring. Mm. He's getting married <laughs> and moving. Well, that could be a good thing or it could be a bad thing. I can only tell you that as fire marshals change, sometimes the rules change. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I do. Anyways. <laughs> I've been dealing with them for a long time. What's the final decision here? We all need to go to bed. <laughs> uh, I think we got to go back and turn the crank with the group one, 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 one more time, Betsy. And, okay. Uh, See where we stand on this. That sounds sounds like a good idea. I haven't right, heard I, anything. I haven't heard anything from Larry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I would say that given everything that I've heard tonight, um, it seems like it's going to be very challenging for you to come up with a plan where you can raise enough money to make this building become a usable facility um, to where your ask from the town is small enough for it to have a reasonable chance of getting past the voters. Um, it, it, it just, with the money, with the numbers that we're hearing, um, it's just, it, it just seems like a, a really big, a really big ask. Um, when we're looking at $800,000 just to get started, um, which is just talking about huge amounts of money, and given the, all the competing priorities for the town, it's it's hard to see how we'll be able to come to the voters and say, 
we want the town as a whole to pick up most of that tab. And if the town is picking up a smaller amount, you might have a chance, but then that's a huge burden for your small group. And uh, it's hard for me to see how you make that work. Not that you can't, but that's, that's what I'm hearing right now. Okay, Larry and the rest of you guys, going along with what he just said, and I know you've discussed this in the past, one of the things my magic wand wishes is that I could find a family who wants to put make a huge donation and have their name on the hall when the time comes, have it be renamed. I have no idea how much that contribution would have to be. Do you? Um, well, we talked about that once before. Just, just as a hypothetical. Um, say you're looking at a million. I'm just gonna take all you can get. I would say, I would say, um, if you're looking at a million, I would say half of it at least, because then what you can do is you can leverage a five hundred thousand dollar, or if you're talking two million, a million dollar. Um, uh, you, you can go public with that gift and kick off your fundraising campaign by saying. You know, John and Jane Doe's family has has kicked in one million dollars to name this the East Randolph the, the Doe family East Randolph Community Center or whatever, and 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 that that sets the model for others to make much more modest contributions, but still with the understanding that they're matching the five hundred thousand dollar gift or whatever you. You, you, you that that's sort of that's development and fundraising 101 for this kind of project. But you got to know what the total project is before right, you exactly. set that amount. You need to know what your total project cost is going to be. Whether you're going to just bottom line it at 850 or try and go for the whole enchilada of 2.2 or whatever. It you is. don't know because the prices, cost of things change all the time. So there's no way to know that for sure project estimating has been pretty consistent over the last three to four months so yeah. it's, it's starting yeah. to level out and get more predictable okay i think what your challenge is is right. would you know if you're asking the question of if phase one is eight hundred thousand, will the town allow the building to be named for 400 i would say we need to know what the whole project is right. you know because if you're going to break it down into smaller pieces, the first piece, somebody shouldn't be able to pay only a portion of that and get it named if the next part of the project is much bigger. Yeah. You know, you got a two and a half million dollar project and you break it down into, you know, a half a million dollars. So for 250, you can have it named after yourself and you got a two and a half million dollar project. That's, seems like a sell Well, at least you got an open building at that point. Yeah, that's true. And Maybe. then you continue to phase up the project. Exactly. We can have a casino night there, bring in some money. Come on, guys. <laughs> so, um, are you Abenaki? Nope. <laughs> nope. No. You can do it. Then. No, no, no. You can have a casino night. It's okay. You have to hire I mean, certain no, people. No, you can have a casino night, but I was going to say. <laughs> you could really make some money if you could get yourself a. Oh, uh, I know some, I know an Abnaki, not an Abnaki, but she's some other kind of princess. She lives right, she lives in Braintree. She's a, she's one of the tribal princess. Oh, she's not the, she's the chief actually. Okay. Doug Bent's wife. Okay. All right, we're ready then. Oh, okay. Yeah. Can we? Sounded like you were going back to. You're going to go back to your, your group, right? Yeah. Okay. Let's see how that goes. Good All right, good night. Bye. Good night. All right. Next up is the manager's report. Uh, beyond what you have listed there, we're moving along with those hiring processes with any luck by the end of the week, early next week, maybe we can have three slots wow. full. So hopefully. Finance really? department back up and then someone in the recreation director's role or at least plans to bring them on board. It'll depend on a few final steps here. Okay. Um, but things are, are looking 
positive, feeling very good about all of these people too. Um, and so it's that, the pained look on yeah. Kim's face. <laughs> And, and that'll that'll go a long way to, to helping us create some time and capacity and, and leveling things out. Um, and, uh, and that leaves a little bit of space to fill out in the field-based positions. We still have the, the two hybrids that you reallocated earlier in the summer. Those are still open and out there in terms of when we split them up. Um, and then we have longtime highway department employee is retiring. So John mm -hmm. Race is leaving. Um, Gave us a little bit of notice. Last day is actually tomorrow. Um, so we'll have to fill that role. We thought we had somebody and made a switcheroo pretty quickly. Um, but much like we've experienced, I don't know, it feels like 37 other times at this point, the current employer or somebody else. Up the ante. Pulls a few more <laughs> dollar Engines. bills out and, and we either lose them or it takes a little bit longer to figure out what's going on. Um, so hopefully with that, you know, if we can fill these other three slots, it basically leaves us three positions from full, which is as close as we've ever been to full, I think, or have been to full for a year. Your tenure. A year, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We had about four weeks, I think, six weeks last fall where we were full. Uh-huh. Hmm. All right. Well, then, keep on making progress. Start moving around. Things are looking up, Larry. <laughs> Don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, and, and like I mentioned in the report, it, I'm optimistic. I think stabilization is sooner. But if for some reason we have to carry some vacancies for even longer, we got to sit down, prioritize what we want to do and how we want to do it, and who's going to do it. And you know, the handful of people are stepping in, covering everybody's a burnt piece of toast at this point. All the crisp, like it's just we're crispy. So we got to figure out how to. Fine balanced. Mm -hmm. But this all works out, which we're hoping it will, planning on it. We'll be in a good spot. It's a, and it's a mixture of folks, too. One case, it's somebody who's been working with us in a temporary capacity, has essentially passed an audition with flying colors, so we have a higher level of confidence in them. And that was done to make sure everybody was okay with it, you know, that it worked for everybody schedule wise, kind of a nice soft entry. Um, one of the other candidates has local experience in that particular role. <coughs> Maybe stealing them from somewhere else, basically. Um, I used to feel bad about such things, but they don't anymore. <laughs> Happens to us, so. <laughs> and so I'm really optimistic. Sorry. As a, as a lot of really good um, experience will fit in really well in that role. And then the third person has a lot of the same types of experience, but in a different sphere. But. Um, had some interesting training in their background, including as an aspiring diplomat, and in certain roles that that'll be a nice addition um, to our capabilities. So it, I'm feeling pretty good. So now that I've said it, I'm also getting to that point where I'm like, now that I've said it out loud, it's all gonna collapse. But um, knock on wood that we'll we'll get there. I don't think there's anything else to add. We had a few things in there that just followed up on stuff. The pay schedule thing is just an audit thing. When we were talking with Cynthia from Nemeric, it makes sense to get into the practice every year, maybe around the first of the year, ideally, where we just sort of have you guys look at a pay schedule for everybody. It'll reflect what's in the budget. So any changes, do you adopt it? And we've essentially created that process element. Um, we could argue that we do it every year when the voters approve the budget, but um, it's a nice little step. And it helps whomever's in that role or whoever has to step into that role know that that's the schedule. Um, so it, it shouldn't be too major, but this lets us, I'm going to do the official signing with the contract. The union were scheduled for 10 tomorrow. We were scheduled for August. Didn't come together. We were here. Um, stuff came up and um, there wasn't anything in a final review other than there was a sentence missing about who could authorize the wearing of shorts. So nothing major, you wouldn't think. <laughs> Sounds like the Live Golf Tour. <laughs> yeah. Uh, essentially, who could, who could authorize you wearing shorts? Um, did you make that decision or did your supervisor be involved? Oh, boy. So small stuff around the edges. There was a lettering issue that was probably a track change, this whole over that kind of stuff. But the numbers all worked out. The language is all there. The intent was all good. So we'll sign that up and then work through uh, making those pay adjustments. All right. Great. 
All right, ready to go to executive session? Do we have any of these that we have to find first? I think, yeah, uh, if I remember right, the leaving the real estate one on there, I believe, requires the finding. And the mediation might as well. Um, if nothing else, you've added an extra motion for Kim to include in a minute so we test out her growing <laughs> skills here. So we first need to find that we need to go into executive session. What's, what's the, what's the finding that? that it's necessary and prudent and that premature general public knowledge would place the town at a disadvantage. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Move the way to executive session. All second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> 